All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the RUSD Board of Education meeting for Thursday, October 27, 2022. This meeting is being live streamed on our RUSD YouTube channel. And if you'd like to view this meeting on our Spanish live stream, please follow the link provided on the agenda, uh, which can also be found on our website, riversideunified.org. Our meeting is being held in person here in the boardroom at the Riverside Adult School and is open to the public. Um, it is. I'm just not speaking right into it. I'm sorry. I don't see any members of the public wish to address closed session items. Mr. Kinnear, no? Okay. So uh, the board will adjourn to closed session and will return at 530.
All right, good evening, everybody. It's 5.30, so we're going to get started. We're back from closed session. Please take a minute and find your seat and get settled so we can get started with our meeting. Perfect, thank you. So good afternoon and welcome to the RUSD Board of Education meeting for Thursday, October 27th. This meeting is being live streamed on our RUSD YouTube channel. And if you'd like to uh, view this meeting on our Spanish live stream, please follow the link provided on our agenda or go to our website, riversideunified.org. Uh, our meeting today is obviously here being held in person here in the boardroom at the Riverside Adult School and is open to the public. Uh, I don't think we'll have an issue with capacity t today, but if we do, please see a member in the back and we will show you to the overflow room. Uh, for members that would uh, wish to address the, the board, uh, please see a staff member and get a card. Uh, as I mentioned, we're back from closed session and the board did take uh, action on two items. Um, the first one by unanimous vote was to move forward with the termination of employee number 272107. Uh, the board also took action with the unanimous vote to appeal the decision of the Commission of Professional Competence in OAH case number 2022030354 via writ of administrative mandate. Um, we'll move on with the Pledge of Allegiance and the Pledge of Allegiance this evening is being provided uh, by video uh, and will feature uh, Chloe Misiano, who is a sixth grade student from High Grove Elementary School. So please stand. Hello, I'm Clem Misiano. I'm a fellow sixth grade student here at Higher Elementary in the RUSD School District. I'm here today to recite the Pledge of Allegiance for this video today. So I want you all to stand up, place your right hand over your heart, and when I say start, you will all begin. And start. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the public for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible for liberty and justice for all. Okay, you can all sit down now. Bye. Oh man, a girl of action. Well done, Chloe. All right, uh, next we'll move on. Item three on our agenda this evening is our high school student representatives. Uh, so we will have in-person reports from uh, our students, and we will start with uh, John W. North High School, Elizabeth Cisneros Oaks. Good evening. Good evening. It should turn on in a second. Check again. Good evening. There oh, go. perfect. <laughs> uh, good evening, President Lee, Superintendent Hill, and members of the board. As you know, my name is Elizabeth Cisneros Oaks, and I'm super excited to be back reporting on behalf of John W. North High School. So the United Student League, we recently sponsored our 57th annual homecoming celebration, which the theme was Huskies After Dark, which was voted on by the entirety of our student body. Uh, on September 23rd, we had our homecoming game and tailgate. So at the tailgate, clubs were uh, provided the opportunity to hold a booth, either just to promote their club or to hold a fundraiser. And then the Alumni Association was invited and was given free admission to the game. And in order to gain school spirit, we held a spirit week coming up uh, or leading up to the homecoming game. And then we had our outdoor dance as well, where we had a ton of students come and it was a lot of fun. We had our um, homecoming theme. So the theme for both the dance and the game was neon. And then also in September, we celebrated National Attendance Awareness Week, where at the last Friday of each month, we have a raffle going for each student who is here and on time in their first period classes. And um, they will, on the morning announcements, it's announced which student won the raffle and they will win a prize, whether it be a gift card, a free yearbook, um, et cetera. And um, they can go up to the front office and claim their prize to recognize that they were here on, on time. And in support of California's High School Voter Education Week, the California Secretary of State, Dr. Shirley Weber, visited our campus and gave presentations to our classes and our student leaders. And it was all about pre-registering for voting. And we got to learn um, about how to pre-register, how to be a poll worker, like a volunteer, and um, really interesting things about Dr. Weber's uh, journey to becoming um, her position. 
During the first week of October, our Renaissance sponsored our annual Cancer Awareness Week, where each day we had a spirit day where we uh, wore a different color representing a different uh, care, uh, cancer awareness. And on that Thursday, we wore pink, where we had our pink out game and tailgate, and this was in honor of the recognition of breast cancer awareness. And then parent-teacher conferences were held on Thursday, October 13th, and Friday, October 14th. And that Thursday, we had a minimum day because the parent-teacher conferences were held in the evening. And on Friday, we had no school, which was nice. And um, <laughs> because the parent-teacher conferences was held in the morning. Our student leaders were there helping to assist the students and the, or not the students, the teachers and the parents um, in finding the each teachers because it could be a little bit confusing in the gym because they're all the teachers were in the gym and um, also just uh, for the parents to also find report cards and um, things of that nature and for the teachers so they know like um, how much time they have that they have uh, parents waiting for them and we also provided interpreters for any parents who are in need of that and report cards as I said for um, each student and 492 families were in attendance which is really great and um, the, our educational academy provided childcare for any families who um, had small children with them. They had movies, games, and coloring pages for the children to be entertained. Now, this past Friday, October 21st, we held our fall sports assembly where we honored various sports that um, were in the fall season. And we had performances held by our dance team and by our cheer teams. And we also recognized our cast for our upcoming fall play, which is the musical comedy Murders of 1940. We're super excited because we invited some of the uni ASB officers to come and kind of shadow some of the um, North USL officers to kind of see what it's like to be in a um, event at North, a ASB run event at North. So that was super nice to have them there. And this week, our Multicultural Council is sponsoring Red Ribbon Week, and the purpose of this is to promote awareness of the dangers of drug and alcohol use and to promote drug-free lives. So we've had dress-up days, lunch activities, we passed out red wristbands, and um, today there was a assembly in uh, periods two, three, and four about um, Red Ribbon Week and then um, promoting the awareness of the dangers of drug and alcohol use. And we're really looking forward to some of the events that are coming up in November. On November 1st, there is a measure own design committee for the renovations at North. So we'll be figuring out how um, North is gonna look after the renovations. And then on November 2nd, the United Student League, Multicultural Council, and Renaissance will host its first ever leadership collaborations with the ASB at University Heights Middle School. So that should be fun. We're gonna have various activities and breakout sessions for um, each ASB to go to. And um, we're also looking forward to the 18th annual RUSC Leadership Exchange that's going to be hosted by Martin Luther King Jr. High School on November 10th and the CATA Leadership Conference that is happening on November 21st at the Disneyland Resort and Hotel. And we are currently fundraising for the CATA Conference, so um, we can go and have a good time. <laughs> Thank you for your time, and I'm super excited to report back in December. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Does anybody have any questions for Elizabeth? All right, thank you so much. Uh, next, from Riverside Poly High School, Isabel Urungaray. Good evening, Superintendent Hill, President Lee, and members of the board. I'm Isabel Urungaray, and I'm excited to provide another board report for Poly High School tonight. The last month consisted mostly of our homecoming activities, which are like no other school. The celebration began with our homecoming dance, where we had over 800 students in attendance. Then we hosted our annual float building, which lasts a week. Our theme this year was board games. Our float building went very smoothly and we are grateful for the contributions of food and time from the community. After a week of float building, spirit days, and lunch activities, it all came together on Saturday, October 8th. Football Boosters hosted a pancake breakfast followed by our parade down Central Avenue. The parade consists of all our homecoming court nominees, sports, and our floats. Poly students, teachers, and the community came to watch. The turnout from the community at Poly Homecoming is always impressive, and I am grateful to go to a school with so many connections and alumni that truly make our school feel like home. Part of this feeling is attributed to one of our new traditions, 
the Bears of Distinction. Our Bears of Distinction and their families participated in the parade and enjoyed a lunch and celebration afterwards. Following the parade, attendees made their way to the pep rally, where we saw our pep squad perform, band perform, and watched our boosters play a fun game. Even though this sounds like a full day, there was still so much more to enjoy. This was our first year bringing back our carnival, which is a fundraising event for all of our clubs on campus. Almost 40 clubs opened a booth and raised money for various activities and events. This year, we also brought back our limp sync competition for the first time in years. This tradition will definitely continue and was my favorite part. Bear Plows, Black Student Union, Principal Centered Leaderships, Puente, Choir, Theater, and Sports Medicine shared a lip sync to various pop songs. A short rest followed the carnival, and then we made our way to the football game. At our halftime show, we announced all our nominees, watched the top 10 dance, and crowned our king and queen, Josh Lopez and Sydney Salcedo. We finished off the night with a big win. Recently, all our sports teams have been very successful. Our volleyball team attended the CIF quarterfinals yesterday. Unfortunately, we lost, but we look forward to next season and have high hopes for our future. Our dedicated team is led by Coach Fullwider, and we have loved seeing all their hard work pay off. Girls Golf has also done well in CIF individuals, and the top six members will attend CIF finals on Monday the 31st. Our football, play, our football team has an away game tomorrow night, and if they win, they will earn, earn their spot in the playoffs. Our cross-country team has finals on November 2nd, and we are grateful to have the number one ranked coach in California and a hardworking team who has done very well in races. Boys Water Polo is ranked number eight in Division Two and won their league finals on Wednesday night. This year, we will also be hosting our first annual Powder Puff game. It will be held on November 2nd, and we look forward to providing students another opportunity to connect with our campus. To conclude, we have spent lots of time dedicated to getting students involved. We have hosted sporting events, activities, and provided encouragement. We look forward to this continued effort and hope to find success in doing so. Thank you for your time. I look forward to providing another report next month. Thanks, Isabel. Any questions for our representative from Polly? All right, well done, thank you for the update. Uh, next, from Ramona High School, Charlene uh, Mayo Adams. Good afternoon, Board President Mr. Brent Lee, Superintendent Ms. Hill, and NSC members of the board. I'm Charlene Mayo Adams. Um, since our last meeting, wonderful new events have taken place at Ramona High School. First, our annual rival football game against Poly took place after our Multiverse of Ramona homecoming dance. Our football team was able to continue their winning streak of four years in a row against Poly High. Ramona boys football will be playing in CIF this postseason. Our homecoming dance was very successful. Uh, students were dancing the night away. Over 700, 700 students attended. At the beginning of October, our, at Ramona, we had our club rest assembly featuring over 60 clubs. Each club had a booth where they were able to set out information about their club and encourage new signups. All Ramona students were given a club booklet with club information and participated in the assembly where they were able to join the clubs. The lifting of COVID restrictions has allowed Ramona students to participate in beneficial field trips. Our heritage students, including BSU students, were able to visit the Martin Luther King High School HBCU College Fair, where many, where many of our students were offered scholarships and acceptance into HBCU programs. Leaders around campuses, leaders around our campus, like USB, BAPA, and BSU, were able to attend the World's Greatest Schools Conference, also known as the CARE Conference. Our leaders learned about different ways to implement leadership through the school, improve our pep rallies, mental health activities, critical thinking, and communication skills. There were many opportunities for our AVID students and other programs to tour surrounding college campuses. For example, our students were taking on a tour of Cal State Dominguez Hills, and tomorrow they have another field trip to La Sierra University. The Ramona Festival of Arts was a smashing success. People in the community were able to participate in interactive activities like our dance circles, drawing, painting, and choir performances. We look forward to upcoming events like the CIA football playoffs and our dance team's V event, dance event. Thank you and go Rams. Thank you, Charlene. Any questions for a Ramona rep? All right, thanks so much for being here. 
And uh, last presentation from our high school representatives this evening from the Riverside STEM Academy, Ava Stowe. Good evening. Can we all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Awesome. Good evening, President Lee, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed board members. I am Ava Stowe, and I am again representing Riverside STEM Academy. Since my last report, a lot has happened around our campus, including the completion of our lower yard with all of the grass and the trees. We're really excited, and with the help of our teachers, PTSA, and student body, we had some of our most successful and well-attended events to date. In September, we held our Pie the President event, as inspired by Poly High School, where students were given the opportunity to pie the president of their choice. That included our principal, all the class presidents, and myself, the ASB president. And needless to say, with over 100 pies sold and all of the presidents needing to be sprayed down with the hose at the end, the event was a great success. And what we had after was our parking space painting for all of our upperclassmen to come in the morning and enjoy some coffee that they brought in and paint their parking spot over the weekend. We had an impressive turnout for both events and succeeded in collecting funds for future ASB events. And for our homecoming, we held a school-wide assembly where we held a performance, as we do every year, to reveal our theme. Through a skit, with the help of the Scooby Gang, we revealed our theme as 70s Disco. And while STEM may not have a football team for our homecoming game, we make up for it for, with our annual Capture the Flag tournament between student, teachers, and alumni that come back the day of. And on homecoming night, we had the largest attendance of any homecoming dance since STEM began. Not only did we have fantastic decorations, music, and food, we brought in a game truck full of various different gaming consoles and simulator setups that for students who are not so inclined to dance the night away, to give them that option. And finally, in October, we held our Red Ribbon Week and a Teen Beach-themed movie, Spirit Week, and at the end of that week, promoted the completion of our human foosball court. Imagine humans playing foosball. It's pretty fun. And the students got the chance to eat snacks and listen to some beachy tunes that day. And unfortunately, with the time I have today, I cannot cover absolutely everything that we've done recently because it has been a lot. But yesterday, we had our Spook Fest, which is our Halloween event, which we had both the middle school and high school, which included a nine-room haunted house with actors, several game booths hosted by the high school, face painting, and a trunk retreat hosted by all of the different clubs, including ASB, Multicultural Club, Yearbook, and a wide variety of more. The event was wildly successful, and despite some setbacks that we had in our early planning process, our leaders on the campus embodied the energy and work ethic that we hope to have as a high school. Hardworking, perseverant, and passionate for the work that we do. We're proud to have made such extensive strides as a school, both in our events and our increased involvement as a student body. Thank you, and have a fantastic evening. Thank you, Ava. Any questions? All right, thanks for being here. All right, and I'll, I'll uh, remind our high school representatives, you're welcome to stay, but uh, I'm sure you have other obligations this evening, so feel free to excuse yourselves if you wish. Um, next, we'll move on to a presentation from the board this evening. Uh, and tonight we have a special presentation that highlights some student educational athletics. And I think Dr. Sosa is gonna get us started and then We'll invite some other individuals to participate. We sure do. Good evening, uh, President Lee, Superintendent Hill, and board members. No? Can you hear me a little better now? Perfect. Good evening, uh, President Lee, Superintendent Hill, and board members. I'm very pleased this evening to introduce a presentation on our Unified Champion Sports Program. We have RUSD retired teacher, Mr. John Corona, coming to speak on the program at Martin Luther King High School that this year won a CIF championship in its inaugural season. So please help me introduce Mr. Corona. Uh, good evening, uh, Superintendent Hill, President Lee, and members of the board. I, as I stand here, I know you're all thinking, I thought we got rid of this guy. But um, I'm here to talk to you tonight about a program that's a relatively new program to our district. It's near and dear to my heart in which Martin Luther King High School and several district schools are helping to lead the way. Um, across the nation, the Special Olympics in conjunction with the state high school sports associations is implementing a program called Unified Championship Schools. Also known as Unified Sports, it's a program designed for the integration of students with special needs into their school's activities, leadership opportunities, and sports so that they are more immersed in their schools and their communities. 
The basic idea is that students with special needs are partnered with their general ed peers in both team and individual sports. They compete together as partners against uh, other such teams for themselves, their partner, their school, and their team. A quick example of how it works would be in track and field. Um, you have, um, excuse me, partners run, let's say they run the 100 meters, and one partner runs 16.5, and one partner runs 13.5. That's a 30 second performance. They take the average of that, which is 15 seconds, and that's how you win awards and places in that competition. Um, for team sports like flag football, there would be like six special ed students involved and five general ed students involved. This concept has grown across the nation in various sports. According to the National Federation of High Schools, over 100,000 kids, special needs kids, are involved in the program. Um, and um, just recently, four seasons ago, the CIF Southern Section partnered with Special Olympics to put on track and field championships events in this, in this area. The competition has grown from a small regional meet to where these student athletes can qualify for state competitions. As Dr. Sosa said, this past 2022 track season, Martin Luther King's UCS track team won the first ever CIF Unified Sports Track Championship. Several Wolf partners were crowned as CIF champions, and the shot put team of Isaiah Butler and Aiden Sos won the Southern Regional Championship, the CIF Championship, and the California State Championship in the shot put. Um, I want to take a minute right now and introduce uh, some of the members of our team. Not all of them are here. To, not all of them are here tonight. They've got we got a football game tonight. Big playoff possibilities, all that stuff. But we've got several members of the team here tonight. Anthony Martin, Anthony, stand up, please. Anthony's got our plaque. Come on up, Anthony. Pull that right there, buddy. Attaboy. And Damien Villarreal. Damien, come on up. And, and, and Lauren Langner. Lauren? Is anybody, is anybody else here in terms of our team members? Okay, and then I need to introduce uh, Unified Sports Coaches, uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Jordan Olivares and Ms. Sandra Lowe, who are UCS coaches and liaison with Special Olympics. Now, real quick, I'm going to introduce you, Mrs. Uh, Lisa Sos, who, her son was a major part of the program for four seasons until his graduation last year, and Lisa's going to tell you about the program from the perspective of a parent. Yeah. Move back just a little bit. Thank you. So my son, Aiden, uh, graduated last year. He's at UCLA today, tonight, for, the, for this year, um, but he took state. He won state. He was a... Uh, he, uh, they, the coaches recognized that he had upper body strength and that he could probably do shot put. Um, so he joined that team. Uh, he, he went all the way through the, through the state championship and won state. So it was very thrilling. He got his ring a couple weeks ago. Um, yeah, so super exciting. He joined when he was a freshman. So he was all through four years part of the RUSD track and field. Luckily, his teacher, Mrs. Lowe, who's also part of the team, was very instrumental in deciding, you know, recognizing students that could do the sport, um, students that were interested, students that took initiative. Uh, Coach Corona was very influential with, you know, letting the kids come to all the practices that they wanted to come to. Some, some went to certain ones, others went to all of them. Um, there was a lot of integration, inclusion, um, even today. So he, met the throwing coach at Simi Valley, which was our finals to, he met the throwing coach for UCLA. He's also met him on campus at UCLA and he's going to probably volunteer and be involved in track and field as well in his post high school, in his collegiate career. So amazing, just amazing, just an incredible program. Um, I can't say enough about it. Thanks, Lisa. And you know, I need to acknowledge our, our parents too. The, the parents of these young people are in the back back there too. They all made sacrifices to get their kids where they needed to go. Um, in, in conclusion, I just want to report that both, uh, besides Martin Luther King High School, Riverside Poly and John W. North have jumped onto the unified sports uh, bandwagon at various levels. 
Uh, it appears that next track season, our USD will be well represented. It must be noted that the goal of this model goes well beyond sports. It's about understanding, inclusion, acceptance. It's about understanding that together, we are better. Anybody got any questions at all? Any questions for Mr. Corona? Okay, what we've given you here is a bare bones yes, description. So if anybody wants to know more about the program, you can contact me, contact Mrs. Lowe. Oh, sorry, sorry. I think Mr. I do. Uh, I have, sorry, sorry, Mr. Sorry, Mr. He's trying Kinnear. to buzz right. in. I couldn't find the button quick Okay, enough. sorry. Uh, I have three quick comments. Thanks, Coach Corona, for all you do and all you've done over the years. It's, what, it's wonderful. Uh, the second comment is, is, uh, is that really everybody, I'm not sure most people recognize the significance of that plaque. Uh, that, <laughs> yeah, that plaque yeah. is uh, is an awesome yeah. plaque to hang in the school forever and ever and ever. Uh, and congratulations to uh, to everybody who's in, involved. And then my last comment is: Do you? I, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. I heard you were the parent, so I'll remember parent. <laughs> uh, but you know, you said it so well. You said uh, your comment was: You know, my, they, they recognized my my son could probably. Yeah. Uh, throw the shot put. He's the state champion of the CIA. <laughs> I know. You know, I know. What, that tells the story, I, I think, of, of what everyone uh, is, uh, is here tonight for. Uh, and then you said it's just, it was just amazing, and I think it's just amazing to all of us. Congratulations. Nice job. Thank you. Thank you. Any idea? Well, just like I said, if anybody's got any questions, you can contact Mrs. Lowe and Ms. Alvarez at King High School. Coach Matt Vassell, the head track coach, is an assistant football coach. That's why he's not here tonight. But you can contact Matt as well. And, and I know, if, if you're really desperate, you can contact me. So anyway, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it being here tonight to give a present uh, talk I think uh, Mr. Kinnear inspired a couple more board members oh, okay. to ask some questions. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Hunt and then Mr. Reddy. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, coach called me. Uh, but about six weeks ago and asked to have coffee. When John Corona calls you, you want to go because you know it's going to be something good. Uh, Coach Corona is the one, the founder of uh, nationally recognized King High Remembers, but I think in his 21st year, John? The, if, you count, if you count our, year, our, our two years on uh, virtual, it's 23. That's, that's, it's fabulous. I'm so impressed with this program and this board has been trying, Mrs. Allegheny and I go back on it, for a long time to uh, find more ways, programs that, that bring our special needs uh, kids together with, with the general population. And I know they had a lot of support. Thank you, ma'am. And he picked a good school, by the way. It's just my personal opinion. But uh, <laughs> thank you, Coach, for what you've done. And it's so exciting that you said Polly and who else? North. They're North both, they're both, they're both, we're all at different levels, but they're, they're getting on board. I know that Arlington's interested in getting on board. We've, we've reached out to Ramona. We're hoping to get the whole district involved. So. Well, kudos to you and the CIF for doing this. And thank for all. John Corona is an example that teachers retire, but they, many of them just can't separate themselves from <laughs> working with young people and advancing young people. And John, you're, you're very special with that. And I admire you a lot. Thanks, thank Tom. you, sir. Uh, Mr. Hunt, pretty appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Mr. Reddy. Um, not exactly a question. I just wanted to say that it's really inspiring to see you guys do uh, everything, everything that I could only dream of, but then going up there and then also inspiring everybody in the district about, you know, how cool it is to just take the plaque and take the award after like many hours, I, I would assume many hundreds of hours of hard work and dedication and all of those different types of things. So yeah, just a comment. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, I just want to commend, commend the students. To be a student is a lot of work and it takes a lot of time to put in, put in work and you got to do the work to be able to do the extra things. So congratulations for, for being student athletes this and for, for being successful student athletes. Before, he got here a little late. This is Christian. So I and hey, Christian. We had cross country. Yes, oh, okay. yeah. that. We had cross country practice today. All right. Well done. I think we're going to take a quick picture. If there's nothing else, we're going to take a quick picture. Okay, quick okay. picture. I do have two members of the public that want to speak. This is not an item that we would normally take comment on, but if, if, you, wanted to, if you wanted to speak now. Uh, well, well, we hadn't we, planned we on that. Yes, I want to hear him because he Oh, yeah. 
Oh, he participated. Okay, there's a, a, an alumni in the audience that wishes to participate. So Mr. Nelson, do you wanna uh, come up here? And I think Ryan as well. I just want to make quick public comment because you really want to hear from Ryan. He's the Absolutely. celebrity here. He was the goalie for Team USA. I don't know if any of you are on the board to recall. Years ago, I brought up unified sports and Special Olympics didn't want to do it and no one wanted to do it. And we kind of did it anyway. And I want to tell you the benefits of that. Um, when I was coaching, uh, we actually started AYSO VIP with our family trust. And Ryan came up to me one day and said, we want to play basketball. And we went to um, region, the local re Special Olympic region, and they weren't very good. And anyone that knows me, I'm a little competitive. So I opened my mouth, which is big, and said, if we're going to practice, we might as well win. Well, we brought in, some, my other son went to school. We brought in some kids to help me coach, because I'm not a really good coach. I was really good at motivating. That yielded 16 straight state titles and 15 years undefeated. Six years winning the Nike three on three, including two years in the open division. And then because we were kind of good in basketball, they transferred us. Um, they said, we, we got another sport you want to try, which was floor hockey. We did that, became Team USA within two years and won a silver medal in South Korea as the only city team. We were beating teams that were all-star teams. That was not because of me. That was because we were unified. We had... Um, Students at Poly High School that came and helped me coach. And if you ever are bored, you could watch. There's a CNN special on that team. Special Olympic team loses 400 pounds in 60 days, 14 athletes. And that's because we are unified. But there's residual benefit. Out of those typical, and remember, I have a lot of kids, so there's nothing as such thing as typical. A lot of those kids made career decisions now because of their interaction um, with our athletes. A lot of them, um, you know, are, the friendships have lasted long beyond the sports time. They're long-term friends. They're, uh, they've learned from each other. We have a lot to learn. People you ask me, you know, that's great. And I said, no, what's great is they include me because we have so much to learn from our special needs community. Hang around them sometimes. They don't have prejudice. They have unbridled love and they accept each other. We could learn a lot. And I'll close with something that we used to say when I would, we were on a speaking tour with um, Finish Line and, and Reebok and Under Armour because of the team. I used to always close with saying, often when you seek to inspire, you are inspired. And remember that. And I want to thank you all for bringing this program. And let's expand it. And I'm going to tell you in a few years, many of these athletes are not going to be in this unified program. They're going to be in your typical program. And they're going to be winning awards. And now this is uh, my son, Ryan. Do you, you want to? OK. He, he just wanted to express how important it was to have the unified. His brother and him became very close in that experience. And to have athletes, and uh, those are relationships you still have with all those guys, huh? Yes, I do. OK. <laughs> and because of that, by the way, most of our athletes that participated that, which is unusual for the special needs community, out of uh, 14 athletes on my Team USA, 12 are working full-time for above minimum wage. I think three or four are married, have kids, live independently, and drive. So, you know, let's work on empowering people, and this is a great way to start. And I was glad you informed me of this program, and anything you guys need that I could help with, you can count on us. Thank you very much. Thank you, much. Ryan. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Nelson. And thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Corona, and yeah, we think we're going to take a quick picture okay. before we uh, have you guys finish you up, right all right? Here. Okay. I think you guys will come right up here. You go to right here. Okay. Sorry, you guys, right? You're my fault. Come down here and line up and oh, hold the okay. plaque, and then the board will stand behind you. Okay. Yeah. I think he wants us up here, Mike. Come on, come on up here. Come on up here. My fault. So I get your front. And then you can scoot this way. Right here. Right here. Right here. Right here.
Excellent. Uh, I'll, offer, I'll offer the same opportunity as they did to our high school uh, representatives. If, if those folks from the Unified Sports uh, want to stick around, you're obviously welcome to. But if you would like to uh, head home, you're also welcome to do that. Uh, next up is our district group reports. And our first report this evening will be from uh, Dr. Azeen Mobashir. She's the president of the Riverside Council Parent Teacher Association, RCPTA. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Board President, Mr. Lee, Superintendent Hill, uh, RUSD board members, and uh, the cabinet. It's been a while since I've been here to report to you. Um, so I just wanted to first thank you all for attending our uh, principal and president meeting in September. That was our first uh, meeting in person. That was completely in person, which was very exciting. So thank you all for attending. And also, I wanted to thank all the wonderful principals who were able to put the time and attend our meeting. We know that for a unit, PTA and PTSA, to be successful, it's very important to have the support of the principals and the administration of the school. So thank you again to them. And uh, with the support of the administration, we, the PTA, can um, bring more programs and more um, funds to our schools and advocate for our students. Um, on to our membership. Our membership is an ongoing um, event through the year, so if you haven't joined yet, please do so. It's very easy, and we, there is an app. I know you have to keep clicking, but, <laughs> but it's easy to join. Um, currently, we have uh, 3,259 members on TOTEM and 1,736 manual members, so our total is 4,995 members. So five more, and we'll make 5,000. So uh, also pretty soon, uh, within the next week, you'll be receiving a save the date from, uh, from us uh, for our Reflections Award Ceremony, which will be held November 16. And we are hoping to um, get Ramona High School, the, their theater. Uh, it's, we're not sure, but just save the date. <laughs> so the topic for this year uh, of Reflection is show your voice. And as you know, the National PTA has a long-standing commitment to arts education. Reflections program provides opportunities for recognition and access to the arts, which boosts student confidence and success in life. Some of our units have already reached to us um, regarding the reflections. Uh, these include Gage Middle School, Amelia Earhart Middle School, Riverside STEM Academy, Lake Matthews Elementary, Shamawa Middle School, George Washington, and Rivera. Arlington High School, Alcott Elementary, King High School, Magnolia, and Ramona. These are just a few of the schools that um, have contacted us, and each year we have uh, more schools. And um, also, finally, um, our parent volunteers are very excited to be able to get back on campuses. Um, book fairs, fall fundraisers, Halloween events are all currently happening. So thank you again, and see you next time. Thank you, Dr. Mobashir. Um, next, uh, we would hear from DLAC, but unfortunately, uh, Ms. Oropesa was not able to attend tonight's meeting, so we look forward to her report next time. So we'll hear a report by Ms. Jessica Shields, who is our president of the District African American Parent Advisory Committee, known as DAPAC. Evening, Board President Lee, Board members, Superintendent Hill, and the community. I'm happy to report out on behalf of DAPAC. So we kicked off the 22-23 school year strong. We are starting our first fundraiser and we'll be selling Still I Rise t-shirts very soon in order to raise funds for supporting our youth through scholarships and other events. Donations are also accepted. Guest presenters have been phenomenal at our parent meetings and, of course, very informative. So 
So far, we have heard from Kenyatta Price, College Board Director of State and District Partnerships, about how to prepare our children for college and career. She also gave us a big update on the new African American Studies AP course that is now available for districts to pilot and launch, in which we really are hopeful that our USD will be a trailblazer in the effort. Also, Rochelle Kidnapsar and Kisa Brown presented to our parents about the benefits of the Heritage Program and also helped parents gain a deeper understanding of the AVID Program. With both programs working in conjunction, it can serve as a win-win for our youth. Now that statewide testing results are published, parents want to know more about how to interpret the data especially as we examine what it means for our African stu American student population. And we are hopeful that Dr. Sosa's team will be able to present the data and answer questions at our November meeting. Now, as a parent group, we do continue to grow in our knowledge and connections by attending events like the annual Excellence Through Equity Conference sponsored by our COE. It is always an honor and privilege to be able to learn and develop our skills alongside a community of educators and educational leaders. And next year, we plan to do a workshop and on how to grow your APAC because we believe so much in homeschool communications and understanding the power of parent engagement on improving student achievement is an important connection to make when building stronger communities. So thank you very much for sponsoring our DayPack leaders to attend. Also this year, we have implemented Your Voice Matters, which is a Jamboard and quick discussion that gives parents room to voice their concerns and their celebrations. And we simply ask two questions. Number one, what is working or has worked well for your child, whether it's school level or district level? And then what concerns do you still have school level or district level. And here are a few responses for what is working. Avid option has worked well for my son. I appreciate the later start for my high school students. Proactive email communication from the school, heritage tutoring, being able to volunteer on campus, coffee with the principal and PTA engagement, 504 review meetings, parent resource center. Here are some of the responses for what concerns still exist. Lack of diverse staffing and students at my daughter's school. I would like to see more communication from teachers, especially at the onset of an issue. The need for avid strategies at all schools, school-wide. Difficulty getting a 504 plan for my child with a diagnosis. It shouldn't be a voting system to get my child what they need and deserve. More outreach needed for African-American students and their families who are having a difficult time financially. Need to remove the barriers of fingerprinting fees associated with volunteering. Improve CTE availability for impacted programs. So as you can see, it's so important to hear from the community so that we can make changes that demonstrate care. So in the spirit of Superintendent Hill's vision using the CARE acronym, let us re-examine it through the lens of a parent with an African-American child. C, care. Ensure that families feel cared for in all spaces within our school community. A, academic achievement. Ensure the academic achievement of African-American students start with measurable actions dedicated to closing the achievement gap, starting with this year's data showing great gains in ELA and math. R, Reduce service gaps. Do this by progress monitoring with fidelity and keep an accountability at the forefront so that African-American students are not falling through the cracks, especially at the elementary level. E, excellence every time. Provide excellence through equity every time by giving our children exactly what they need to thrive in environments where they do not represent the majority racial or ethnic group just about every aspect in their educational journey in RUSD. No more excuses. As always, I appreciate your time and for supporting our community. Thank you. All right, thanks, Ms. Shields. Um, next, from uh, the president of the Special Education 
Community Advisory Committee, uh, Ms. Alicia Ricks. Good evening. Good to see you. Good evening. I always get this messed up. Okay. Can you hear me You're now? You're good. Yeah. Can you hear okay. just perfect. Okay. <laughs> good evening, uh, Board President Lee, Superintendent Hill, and board members. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for inviting me to speak tonight. I want to give you an update around our Community Advisory Committee. Um, we started off the year strong with, uh, of course, my favorite, uh, inclusive practices throughout the district. Uh, Kirsten did a wonderful job, as always, um, engaging our parents. We did our first um, inclusive practices meeting online, and we did have 22 parents attend, which is huge. Um, usually it's not that many. So we are doing the robocalls, the emails are going out, we're looking at doing text messages as well. So the it's working, it's a slow progress, but I'm happy with the progress that we are making. Um, so our next meeting is gonna be next week on the 3rd, and we are gonna do financial wellness with the new speaker, and his name's Mark. He's also an expert on Medi-Cal and Social Security for our kids. Um, so I'm expecting a huge turnout for that. Um, we are looking at doing in-person with the option of parents being able to join online as well. Um, and Polly has graciously given us one of their rooms to use for our meetings, so thank you, Mr. Hansen. And then I also wanted to let you know about our life skills room. Um, I have brought it up to your attention before. It is going very well. We have, um, we figured out how to make a real kitchen at Poly High School and we did receive um, approval to get started. So the work should be starting soon. So I'm super excited about being able to provide the kids a kitchen. Uh, Mrs. Murtaugh also does a wonderful job and she's really gonna enjoy the space. So thank you. Excellent. Thanks for the update. Appreciate that. Excited to hear about those upgrades at Poly. Uh, so that'll conclude our district group reports this evening. Uh, we'll move on to item G, our district superintendent comments. This is Ms. Hill. Thank you, President Lee. And good evening, everyone. In recent weeks, I've been able to visit Twain and Victoria Elementary Schools. When I'm at schools, I'm looking for our four areas of focus that we have for this year uh, to improve student learning. And I, each week, I see more increasing attention to our, our grade level standards, our higher level thinking, uh, and the other factors that we're looking for. This week in particular, we're also at, in uh, Red, Rib Red Ribbon Week, where we um, talk to our students about the dangers of drug use. And as you know, uh, fentanyl use is a big um, concern uh, throughout the area. So some of our schools are participating in an awareness campaign about that. Uh, on another note for areas of an area of concern, I know that some of you are aware of a social media post that was shared on the Instagram page, Poly, Riverside Poly Theater Arts. I do want to clarify that the uh, information that was on that site in that workshop was not a Poly event or a district sponsored event, nor was it taking place on an RUSD site. Um, once it was brought to our attention and we talked to staff, the, the flyer was removed. Um, so I do want to note that when these matters come to our attention, we do address them. And related to this particular, particular event, the board and I have discussed the need to update our social media policies and our practices with, uh, for students and employees for use. So that's a little action plan in and of itself. So more updates on that in the future. Uh, I do also want to speak to, for me personally, a disappointing aspect that some of our community members also moved the post from the Poly uh, Theater Arts site, which uh, had a smaller following to a larger one, even after the post had been taken down from the Poly uh, one. So this is really just in the spirit of for those here and the listening public with us working together when that happens and things go viral, as we say in these days, it, um, it really takes time away from time that could be better spent on our kids. You know, so I have a lot of damage control to do. Not that I'm not willing to do it. I have to do it. It's a 
it's an art school thing. I have to do it, but it does take uh, time away from the benefit of our kids, time that could be focused and committed to improving our student learning and well-being. Um, so I know we all want to move forward together for the, for the best of our students, and I just hope for that aspect to improve also. In the spirit of going above and beyond for our students, I just kind of want to give a shout out to our personnel team. Um, those of you who attend these meetings regularly know that um, we've been struggling to fill our pos positions for um, instructional assistant for special ed. And um, our personnel team decided to do something out of the box and hold an on-the-spot hiring event, which they did uh, last Saturday. 120 people showed up, and the team was there to help them with the online application platform and move them immediately to the test for that particular job and then move them right to the screening that they needed for the test. So already we've had 88 candidates clear the screening, 13 are on the job, and some of the others are doing the, um, the uh, they have to do the drug testing and the physical testing uh, at, a, at a different location. But kudos to personnel. <laughs> um, and when I, I was at a, a different event in another city, and when I came in in the morning, everybody on the first floor t told me that they were, one, so impressed with the people who showed. They came ready. The team was texting me pictures of the candidates who came. They came ready to be hired and interviewed for the job. And, and a couple even left crying, happy that they had, had got the job. So it was just neat to, to be onboarding. Um, people who we need in positions to support our students and just doing something a little bit out of the box that had so much benefit for our kids. Lastly, we're wrapping up our State of the District video series this week. I hope when you get the video series, you click on them and watch them. They're super short, but they're good. Um, if you have not had the opportunity to watch them, they're at uh, our site, riversideunified.org slash SOTD for State of the District 22. You can retrieve the resources there. So that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Lee. You're welcome. Thanks, Superintendent Hill. Um, we'll move on to H, which is public input. At this time, members of the public may uh, provide comments on any items of business to be transacted or discussed by the board that are not already listed on this evening's agenda. Uh, the board is limited to the responses that we may wish to offer uh, on topics that have not been agendized yet, we can ask clarifying questions. Uh, I would also like to note that any public comments that were submitted via the electronic communication submission form have been attached to this agenda item and can be viewed online. Uh, I believe there was one comment online. Uh, Mr. Kinnear, our very dutiful clerk, has already provided me with the comment cards Six for this comments. evening. Six comments. Uh, I'll just take them in, in order in which they were received. Uh, and the first one is from Stephanie Peterson, followed by Joyce Skalicki, followed by Amy Sisko. Just a reminder, you have three minutes. Good evening, Superintendent Hill, President Lee, and members of the board. Last month on September 19th, my son who attends an RUSD middle school took a student needs assessment. He shared with me a question that was directed to all students in his class taking the survey, which was required by a science teacher. The question asked whether or not my child needed help understanding or forming his gender identity sexual orientation. Why would RUSD think this is appropriate to ask any child? What do you do with the child who answers yes? That concerns me. This is not part of the curriculum of math, science, history, or English. This is a violation of our trust in you to educate our kids on the subjects we entrust you to teach. Let kids be kids. In due time, they will organically discover who they are and who they like. Stop confusing kids with gender identity and sexual orientation. You are doing more harm than good and by pushing this agenda and indoctrination in our schools. As a result, I have sent letters to principals at Gage and Poly to opt my children out 
of all future surveys and assessments not related to the subjects of their enrolled classes without further notice or until further notice. RUSD and Riverside Public Health were very concerned about COVID-19. Where is that same sense of urgency in educating our RUSD families and students about the dangers of fentanyl? Fentanyl is the leading cause of death for ages 15 to 45. Our children are being targeted through social media. Fentanyl is even made to look like candy. We need to educate our kids to prevent fentanyl poisonings or overdose. Our Sheriff's Department and Drug Enforcement Administration are happy to come out and speak to our schools. I would like to see this made an RUSD priority. This month at Gage, our principal advocated for a spirit day where the students were to wear tie-dye shirts in support of LGBTQ month. This is not an appropriate spirit day for our students. Again, stop pushing sexuality on our students. Don't ever assume because parents don't speak up at a school board meeting or schedule a meeting with their school principal that parents aren't paying attention and that they agree with what's happening here. Because we're not talking to you doesn't mean we're not talking to each other. Parents have been awakened and are not willing to co-parent with education. We need to work together with transparency, putting our students first. Many of our students have fallen behind due to COVID shutdowns and virtual learning. What is our USD going do, to do to assess the students who need help to bring them back up to grade level? The RUSD test results in math and English are disappointing and, unaccepting, and unacceptable. We need to do better. We must do better. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Joyce? Oh, you have a question? Sure. Just a minute, yeah, ma'am. My question is not for the speaker, but for the uh, superintendent, and it doesn't have to be answered right now, but, and thank you to the speaker, particularly on the fentanyl item. But this is the second time this is the question on a questionnaire to students about their sexual identity and gender identity, I should say. Is this an item that's required by the state laws that we adhere to regarding LBGTQ plus uh, protections and identification uh, guaranteed to these individuals, these children and adults? Um, is it connected to that or is it something that is determined by the district independent, districts independently? I couldn't answer that right now, Mr. Hunt, no. because I, I'll follow up with Ms. Stephanie and ask her about the particulars of the survey and then with the teacher, principal, and I'll come back with some information. Thank you. I, I, I'd appreciate it. I'm sure my colleagues would, too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Skalicki. Go ahead. Um, good evening, President Lee and Superintendent Hill um, and board members. <laughs> I wanted to talk to you tonight about what was on the Instagram page, and thank you, Ms. Hill, for already touching on this a little bit, but I, I do want to go ahead with what I had to say. Um, what we saw about a little more than a week ago posted on the school's uh, theater arts Instagram page regarding the uh, drag workshop is fully unacceptable, and I'm glad that you guys rec are recognizing that. Um, one of the things that I wanted, I've already heard for, through the grapevine, through the other parents, as our, the previous speaker said, we do talk to each other even if we're not talking to you, that this was a mistake and it was not a school-sponsored event. However, um, that leads me to ask the question of what processes do we have in place or do you have in place to monitor what's going out on the school Instagram pages? What are we looking at for root causes for this particular incident? And what are you doing to correct that or prevent that from happening again? And I know, Ms. Hill, you did touch on that a little bit. And I would ask, not only on behalf of myself, but the other parents, that you would follow up on that with a lot more detail on what's going on related to that. And the last thing, some teacher, obviously, I don't know who exactly, posted that on the Instagram page, I assume. So my question further is, not only looking at your processes, your root causes for something like this happening, is what are you doing around discipline for the party who did post that item on your school page? Last year, I was at this board meeting when there was a lot of discussion over the insensitivity that one of your teachers showed to our indigenous students. 
And I would like you to, to give the same consideration for the insensitivity shown to uh, the innocence of our children. And though this event was 14 to 17, 17 is almost an adult, but it is still a child. So that's what we're asking you and charging with you guys with doing is coming back to us with root causes, process improvements, and how we're going to prevent these things from happening in the future. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next, uh, Amy Sisko and then Catherine Gordon, followed by Sandy R. Good evening, Ms. Hill, Board President Lee, and members of the board. My name is Amy Sisko. I'm a proud mom of three RUSD students, two at Poly, one at Bryant. And uh, first of all, I just, I have to give credit where credit is due. Last night, we took our youngest to the Poly Trunk or Treat event um, under the direction of Mr. Hansen, and it was a fabulous event. The Poly students were so engaging. Um, after coming off of COVID and all the detriment that did to students, to see them happy and, you know, I'm an old mom now, so to see these teenagers having good, clean fun just warmed my heart. My 17-year-old, almost 17-year-old, loved passing out candy on behalf of Polly um, Soccer, and my 7-year-old loved it. So good job, Polly. Way to reach out to the community and have some good fun for these teenagers. But that is not why I'm here this evening. I'm here to discuss the recent state mandate about adding tampons in the boys' bathroom. Um, so why are we catering? My question is, why are we catering to a very small few amount of students who could use the nurse's bathroom? Why are we using all of our money, resources, time, and energy by putting tampons in a boy's bathroom. I have a son, I'm not saying he's immature, but I can see maybe sixth grade, because I know this is junior high, sixth grade here is elementary school, some sixth graders using tampons to put them in their nose, further embarrassing some girl students in elementary school who might have periods already. Um, not to mention, I. Since I have teenagers, I was aware of the TikTok viral and the boys' bathroom taking off toilet lids and soap dispensers, which is just terrible. So I don't think any good will come from this. I hope we really push back against this. Um, parents, I implore you to vote. Remember, we have an election in a couple of weeks. Vote for the board members that are going to fight for your kids. One last comment uh, to Ms. Hill. I understand that... Um, with in regards to the drag queen performance, I made comments on that, and mine were respectful, and I hope other parents were respectful also. But I um, and I can appreciate all the extra work it took. As you know, my mom was a school board member. I completely respect all of you guys and the amount of work that it takes to appease parents. But some of that frustration shouldn't be with the parents, but with the teacher. And I don't agree in cancel culture on any side, so I'm not saying this teacher should be canceled or fired, but also there should be the same amount of responsibility on both sides. So, and also my daughter did track at Poly last year, and that program with the special needs was phenomenal. So good job. Thank you, Ms. Cisco. Um, Ms. Gordon, and then Ms. R, and then Jennifer T. It's our last one. Good evening, members Good evening. of the board, Ms. Hill. Um, and my name is Catherine Gordon, and I'm also the proud parent of three children in RUSD. Um, I also attended the um, trunk or treat last night. It was great. I really hope to see more of the um, student for student events uh, like that. It was fantastic. My kids loved it and got way too much candy five days before Halloween, but that's okay. Um, I'm here to share a list of things I'm grateful for at RUSD. We live in a world where we hear every day about what's going wrong, and while I don't seek to espouse toxic positivity at all, here are a few things that are going right in my eyes. I'm thankful for teachers. Every day they bring their creativity, can-do attitudes, and expertise. Mrs. Smith at Jefferson was one of our first introductions to RUSD. And wow, did she work hard and hold high expectations that kept our daughter striving. 
I'm thankful for the food my kids get through the nutrition services program every school day. While I can't be sure that they eat the vegetables they are offered, because vegetables, I'm grateful for the staff who work to make them an option again every day. I'm thankful for every teacher, administrator, and staff member who kept us going through the virtual pandemic year. Not a day was easy for any of us, parents and teachers and administrators alike, but we did it. I'm thankful for the diversity of opportunity. Where I grew up, learning any language other than English before high school wasn't even an option. And now my kids are learning in two languages. Student representatives, Abhinav, thank you so much. And for the student representatives who are here earlier, your examples are, you guys are an example for my own kids, okay? Um, I'm really hoping to bring them to a board meeting at some point, so thank you. Um, it's an example of what their own future could hold. Um, the Polly Trunker Treat, again, my kids loved it. Um, I'm really grateful for the focus on social emotional learning. Now, more than ever before, students need schools to be a safe place, not only physically, but also for the emotional health of all our kids, um, particularly those most at risk of negative outcomes. And there are many. I'm grateful for the state of the district reports. I've actually viewed a few and gosh, it's a really great place to find a lot of information about things that are going on at RUSD that I had no idea about. So thank you for putting the effort into doing that, each of you um, and all of the tech people who are behind that too. Um, and I'm grateful for your seeking the protection of students who are not in the majority and may not even have safe spaces at home to discuss what they are going through. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gordon. Uh, Sandy R. So before I get into my public comment, I just want to say that um, your comment, blaming the community for being involved and sharing and informing others, uh, Ms. Miramontes had every right to share that with the community because if the district feels comfortable posting something like this on their social media, what aren't they posting and sharing with our kids that we don't know about? Your disappointment is misguided. It should be with your staff and why your staff felt so comfortable that this was acceptable. Is this the atmosphere that you have in the schools that sexualizing kids is, is acceptable? So I think you need to refocus that. Um, so, less than two weeks until we find out who fills these seats, and I would like to stress to parents why these positions are so important. These last two years of dealing with school closures, mandatory masking, and leftist ideologies being pushed on our children, we came to realize how much power your positions had over our children and our lives, and how much you didn't care about students or parents. We attended your meetings, we wrote letters, we called in, and it all fell on deaf ears. We told you how much our children struggled with remote learning, isolation and masking, and again, crickets. You refused to file for waivers. You refused to write a resolution um, to the governor. All the while, schools across the nation in red states stayed open, and even private ones here locally like Woodcrest Christian, proving that kids could remain in person safely. Now that we all know the truth about the pandemic, the vaccines and the masking and how horribly wrong everyone got it, we know that the union's role in keeping, what the union's role was in keeping schools closed. Reopening was used as a bargaining tactic to negotiate a bonus with the new summary opening COVID money that was entirely given to staff as, um, uh, as bonuses. Meanwhile, at home, parents got to see what was going on in the classrooms. Some teachers did great, engaging, and really tried, and others showed that teaching our kids was not their priority. The pandemic served to wake up many parents about the issues in school. Now that I've been coming to your meetings on a regular basis, parents are reaching out to me. They ask me for help because they know that I'm not embarrassed to come up here and talk to you, that I don't fear your retaliation even though I've experienced it. Parents have concerns. They had concerns about that drag workshop being promoted at Poly, the fights going on at King, the gender neutral Spanish language push at Castleview. The mom concerned that her son is having to share a boy's restroom with a girl who uses a funnel device to pee next to him at the urinals at Earhart. The mental health fair at Arlington with condom contests. So why do they reach out to me? They reach out to me 
because they don't get any resolution from you. They should be getting resolution from you. They should be getting responses to their emails from you. So if you guys can't do it, then maybe we need to fill these seats with people who will respond and handle these situations. Jennifer T. And we did have one late card come in, Missy, so that'll be the last one for this evening. Good evening. I wasn't going to speak tonight, but I felt inspired after hearing Ms. Hill's um, explanation of the um, issue that happened last week. So I appreciate that you guys are addressing it. It was removed immediately the next morning when it was brought to your attention. Um, but I will point out that it was up for four days before it was brought to your attention. I have a screenshot. There's a date on it. It literally says 4D. So I wouldn't have seen it if it wasn't up for four days. Um, and I, I did hear that this is not a school-affiliated um, Instagram page, although it literally says Poly Theater, and it literally has the theater director's name on it when you click on it. So obviously something went wrong, um, and obviously somebody agreed that something went wrong to remove it so quickly. But I will say that it is disappointing that you had to point out that somehow this is you know, the parents and giving us a little slap for sharing it. Um, and I'd like to give you some advice, answer the parents and then this won't happen. We won't feel like we have to blast something like that if we knew you were responding to us. I mean, I've been here only a handful of times and I've never heard you speak or put an agenda item on your agenda that I've asked for. We had a gentleman who molested 14 kids at one of our elementary schools and we said, what are you doing to keep our kids safe? Has that ever been discussed again? No. And a lot of parents reach out and say, what do I do? I don't get responses. So start speaking to these things. You know, if you disagree, like for example, the tampons in the boys' bathrooms, I can't imagine that any of you would think that that's a good idea. Say that. Why aren't you speaking up and saying, this is crazy, but it's a California law, so this is how we're going to accommodate it in the best way we can, and we're gonna communicate with the parents that this is happening which I don't think you did, saying, hey, heads up, your little kid's gonna have tampon in his bathroom and he might not even know what a tampon is. So if you communicated with the parents better, the parents would not feel that they have to blast something on social media. So once again, take accountability. You guys don't take accountability. Your teachers don't take accountability. The first thing that came out was, oh, it, was, you know, it wasn't our fault, someone posted, we didn't know, we didn't know, we didn't know. That, that's not fair. And it's not fair to blame the parents who are bringing these issues to you to say that somehow this was the parents' fault. Um, so just do a better job at communicating and speaking up on the things that you know are wrong um, so that we have some connection that something's going on that you, know, you guys are getting what we're saying. Thank you. Missy. Hello. Um, I want to first um, say that I do echo the comments that have been made regarding um, Ms. Hill's comments. I kept thinking I possibly could have heard wrong that it sounded like it was a burden <laughs> that we were defending our children and standing up for something that we just vehemently are against of the over-sexualization of our youth and that this post about um, this drag queen workshop was just beyond appalling. And that is absolutely nothing that should be targeted towards our kids at all. It's, it's, it's sickening. Um, but um, what my main point that I did want to talk about, which I did want to actually thank Ms. Hill for, was um, it was something I believe you wrote in a letter regarding the fentanyl epidemic that we have going on right now. It's something that my friends and I have been discussing quite a bit lately. Um, we've, everyone's been seeing the posts about candy, uh, sugar cereal, all these things that are disguised with fentanyl in them, and it's killing kids. I mean, I, I don't know the statistics. I didn't have time to look that up, but um, I know that it's terrible, and um, it's just getting worse and worse, and, and kids just so innocently could just get candy from a friend, open up a cereal box, and, and die. So I have a proposal. Um, I haven't worked out all the details, <laughs> but it's been something that's been heavy on my heart is um, I think RUSD needs to implement a plan um, regarding fentanyl overdoses um, that could very easily be happening in schools, could happen tomorrow. Um, I did hear of an incident that happened at Arlington High School. I don't know if that's what it was. I'm not saying it was, but it triggered and reminded me that I, I did need to speak on this tonight. 
that I believe um, all of our campuses um, need to train all staff, um, including admin, teachers, even substitute teachers, coaches, campus aides, um, uh, to recognize drug overdoses, um, specifically fentanyl. And because we know time is of the essence um, in ch with this being children's lives, um, I think it would be wise um, to provide Narcan or an equal um, antidote to every classroom, every school office, as well as staff and um, campus aides, coaches, um, anybody, they should have them on them. Um, all the millions and millions of dollars that we got for COVID on all the stupid things that didn't work and actually hurt kids, you know, like the masks and all that BS. Um, this is something that literally there's no question it saves lives. Um, and so um, this is something I think the training is very simple. I've just found something really simple. I don't have much time, but um, I think money and this should be top priority over um, social emotional learning and all of these other you know, organizations and things that, that are actually hurting kids, this literally saves their lives. And I, I would love to see this be on the agenda and be something that involves the parents and the community immediately. Thank you. All right, that concludes public input uh, for items not on the agenda this evening. So I'll move on to board members' comments and we'll start this evening with our student board member, Mr. Reddy if he has anything to share this evening. All right, sounds good. So um, so I guess just like a quick roadmap, I'll be going over the things that were said in the meeting from the, student, uh, from the high school representatives uh, to the public comments and the unified, sports, um, the unified sports presentation. And then I'll be giving a quick thank you um, as this is my last board meeting that I'll be attending uh, to a huge number of people and a note about my time here. So bear with me as this may take a little while. So first off, I wanna congratulate all of the high school, uh, high school representatives for saying so much about what schools have been doing over these last couple of months. From the Red Ribbon Weeks, and I found it especially cool that the University ASB was doing shadowing with the North USB, and I, I think that's really cool, especially when you have some type of connection between middle school and high school students in a shared, uh, in a shared manner, such as student governance. Um, in addition, they talk about CADA. We will be going to that too. We're looking forward to it, not only for the fun that we'll be, we will be having, but also for all of the lessons we'll be learning from the CADA School Board Association and all of the CADA student leaders. Um, in addition, uh, I loved uh, the Festival of Arts. I saw a recent Instagram post on that, and it was really cool to see everything from uh, live paintings being done to chalk art on the sidewalks. Um, I really wanna pinpoint the thing that my fellow student, Ava Stowe, said about stu uh, ASB students in Riverside STEM Academy, and in general, students there, in that we are hardworking, passionate, and persevering. I think that's a perfect exemplification of who we are and how we approach problems. That being said, going on to the unified sports presentation, um, I couldn't fully form my thoughts at that time, but genuinely it sent chills down my spine when we had that public comment about uh, how many titles they had won and how much they've made progress. And it was something that was super, super cool to hear about. Um, hearing the recent success of the King Unified Sports Agenda, um, it just makes me excited to see that so many different schools are on board with this. Um, I wanna thank uh, people such as uh, Ms. Jessica Seals, Dr. Mobasher, and Ms. Alicia Ricks for giving us valuable information from the PTSA slash Riverside Council Parent Teacher Association um, the uh, DAYPAC group and the Special Education Community Advisory Committee. Um, it makes sense to hear from them and it also gives me a very clear idea of what's happening from beyond the student perspective, whether that's in student governments, but also from the parents, from the district, and from different uh, local interest groups. I did want to specifically talk about the AP African American Studies uh, program. I did a quick research on it and uh, I found that it was being implemented this year in 60 schools nationwide. Now, I don't know the full logistics of it, but 
I feel that it would be beneficial to start uh, to look into how we can start implementing this, whether that be in the 2023 or 2024 school year. While I don't, I personally won't be there as next year I'll be going off to college. I do think that it will be a very beneficial class to have, especially in uh, large high schools where the population is better served. Um, now, I did want to give some quick comments on the public input. Uh, we thank you once again for coming up and saying your things. It means a lot, especially to me, to hear what you guys are saying from the five things that uh, couldn't exactly catch your name, but the five things that you are thankful for to um, the fair, com the f absolutely fair comments you guys had about the fentanyl poisoning um, and other concerns, whether that be the test results or the recent um, the recent incident with Polly. Um, uh, what I what I did want to say from a student perspective on fentanyl is, while I did I do echo the con the echo the solutions that were given, whether that be the Riverside sheriffs coming in and presenting on fentanyl or providing solutions that were outlined. I don't exactly remember the drug name, but uh, allowing teachers and administrative staff to see what they can do about that. Um, I do think that's something that we have to look into. That would be beneficial to look into. Um, I do think that now I did want to provide a little bit of a student perspective on the on the on the social media post that was done. Um, while I do not, uh, while I have not specifically heard about that post or interacted with it in any specific way, um, from a student perspective, a large majority of clubs on our campus have their own uh, have their own personal Instagram pages. Um, while it is tied to the school in the sense that they may have it in the description, such as Riverside STEM Academy. Um, pre-med health club, something like that. Um, I have never seen a general acceptance that, uh, more that we've never had the situation before, at least in Riverside STEM, um, but it's always been that clubs, while they're represented by the school, have their own autonomy. And now, what we have started to present in these recent years, whether that be through ASB or pre-med health club or things like CSF and other um, major clubs was that uh, administrators, especially the principal and vice principal, we would quickly run by the run the post by them. It wouldn't be like an in-depth check, but it would just be, hey, uh, we have this post. Could you maybe check it and see is, if there's anything that could be done about it? Um, now, obviously, social media often warrants a, uh, a a sense of urgency. So we, this was never a long process in that it had to be sent to the administrative staff and then to the principal, then back to the teacher. But it was just a quick, hey, I saw, like, I saw Dr. Oh, no, Mr. Standifer across the campus. So I would just say, what do you think about this post and send it over. Um, personally, I would not like to give any specific comments about the drag workshop or whatever was said in that post, but I did want to provide a student perspective on what happens in club Instagram pages, which I think it's important to realize that this was not a school sanctioned uh, Instagram page head by, stu uh, by administrative staff, but, but rather by students. Um, at least that's what I've heard from Mr. Hunt and other people. I did want to bring a, uh, I did want to say um, the, comment made by our lovely community member. I'm sorry I didn't get your name, but uh, the five things that you're thankful for. Um, I think the small amount of, while all of your concerns are very true in this case, um, it is very nice to hear about the things that we are doing correct. And um, thank you for that. Now, after that very long-winded explanation, I'd like to give a quick farewell for a farewell note. Um, I make it sound so solemn. I will be working with Dr. Perez, Dr. Souza, and many other people in the backgrounds while my lovely colleague, uh, Corinna James, would, will be taking over my position for the next four meetings. But um, I do find a little, a little tinge of sadness of not being able to sit in this chair and hear everybody's concerns. Um, now, 
Uh, there are many thank yous from Dr. Perez, who has been there throughout the entire process and is willing to listen to my often far landish ideas, to Dr. Martin, who was willing to respond to my text at 9.30 in the night about <laughs> whether I could make a meeting the next day. So um, I just wanted to give a huge thank you to you guys. I also wanted to thank Mr. Hunt for honestly just keeping up with all the badgering of questions I had, whether that be, um, why is the presentation so long, or how should we make sure that this works out? And um, it's, it's honestly been such a pleasure to work with Mr. Hunt. Um, all of the other board mem members, Mrs. Alavi, uh, Mr. Kinnear, uh, Ms. Renee Hill, Mr. Lee, and Dr. Farouk? Yes, okay, <laughs> wanted to make sure I get the honorifics correct. Um, have been super nice to me in making sure that everything I do is underst uh, understandable and also um, is representative of who I am as a person. And when I came into this board member position, I didn't necessarily think that it would be so welcoming from the, all of the assistant superintendent staffs to all of the different board members. Um, it was really nice talking to you guys and figuring out more about who are the people who lead our district. So that's really nice. Um, I did want to say thank you, especially to my uh, language arts and ASB director, Mrs. Murray. Um, I know this is taking a little while, but um, she has been instrumental in in guiding me as a person throughout high school, whether that be answering my questions about, oh, why didn't I get class president in freshman year? Or um, ask, like talking about how, what does it mean to be a effective leader on a campus that is new, right? Um, and honestly, I could go on and on about it. There's so much that I could have said, but Mrs. Murray is one of the people who is a guiding light in my thing and in my life and she, honestly does not get enough recognition for what she does. Um, a quick note about my time, I was really surprised to hear about presentations from, ranging from architecture um, for the project team school and or to how population trends affects uh, student enrollment in our dif district. I never thought that, um, I never thought that topics such as population ecology to um, human design interactions would be coming up in in a board member meeting, if that makes sense, in the governance of an education system. So that concludes my comments. I really hope to see you guys at events uh, later on throughout the year. But yeah, um, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Avi. Uh, next, Ms. Alavi. I can't believe you have me following our student board member. That was really wonderful. And I know Mrs. Murray, and she's a wonderful teacher. I agree with you. And you brought up so many good topics in your, in your words. You know, it's hard being a board member uh, when things happen in the district that you do not think should happen uh, because you are a representative of the district and you want to stand behind the people who are doing right. And there's a lot of people doing right in this district. Out of the 5,000 employees or so that we have, we have sometimes a few employees that make mistakes. And when they make mistakes, they make a lot of, um, they, they get a lot of attention. And we get a lot of attention for that. And I'm not saying that um, that's correct, uh, you know, we, we're happy to hear everybody's viewpoints about that. However, sometimes you cannot stop people from making stupid mistakes. And sometimes they make stupid mistakes. And we, we try to think of ways around that and we correct things, we, we advise, we, we discipline. Those are things we do. I don't always agree, or very seldom do I agree, with all the education decisions that the legislature puts their fingers in. I don't agree with tampons in bathrooms, but that is not, that is unfortunately not something I can make a decision about because it came from a legislature. So when you say to the board that 
you want us to do something about a law that is put into place by the legislature, you're asking really uh, something that we are not responsible for. You can go to the legislature. You can t uh, discuss it with them as well. We have certain limitations as a school board. But I want you to know that personally, personally, those things do matter. And we do uh, get as upset as a lot of parents do. But we also stand by our students. And we stand by trying to help the most students do the best they possibly can every day. Our teachers are really phenomenal at doing that. So thank you, Mr. Reddy, for your wonderful comments. You were a wonderful school board member and really enjoyed your comments uh, meeting after meeting. It was really nice having you. And I thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Alvey. Uh, next, Mr. Hunt. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Uh, just a minor thing, but I would ask that we look into, we talked about this when we redid this room for ADA purposes, et cetera, that we look into sound baffling. Uh, this room is 95 years old. It's poured concrete, and everything just bounces around. And I, I think if it's hard for me to pick up on it, I'm sure it's, it's difficult for the audience, but uh, just of our facilities, that's not measure O money. I know it's our maintenance money, but um, to one of the speakers, and I I promise you I wrote this before she spoke, but I agree with her, and it's not something that y'all haven't heard from me before, but it is very important for us to communicate uh, as to why certain things, let's take the tampons in the, in the bathrooms at the middle and high schools, and the state law said to put it in sixth grade, which uh, we, because our middle schools don't include sixth grade, we, we haven't, but to explain this, and uh, yeah, I find it, bizarre, but, but it does align with public law. And our legislature has put that forward. It aligns as the COVID did. And COVID was not wrong, as a as speaker indicated. As uh, Mr. Thurman, and I'll talk about that, superintendent of state, state schools, Mr. Thurman, pointed out 95,000 people in California died from COVID. One of, the, one of those people included my mother-in-law. And I watched it, and it is, it is terrible. And uh, so to say it wasn't is your opinion, but to ignore the facts, which often happens, it appears, and that's why communications, as the speaker talked about, and I has, have many times, communication or miscommunication or not, lack of communication creates a perception that is completely uh, often, I will say, uh, misguided and so it is incumbent upon us to do that it's not always easy i was not pleased with the posting from the poly high theater club i think the uh, the gentleman who is the director who i appreciate um, should have thought a little more and i i encourage ms hill our superintendent hill that we help set up some guidelines about posting i would just generally say that the the principal at each school is sort of the editor-in-chief of uh, publications, even though I want to keep them separate, as, uh, as Board Member Reddy talked about. But I want to be sure we, we be a little more sensitive to certain things. I don't want us to come down on clubs. Clubs are extremely important. You all realize, and we've talked about it for a long time, two plus two. If a, child, if a student will get involved, particularly in high school, in two groups, whether it's the chess club, football, choir, whatever, the theater club, uh, young life, that they will be more, their grade point average will go up by one, and they will be, because they're more involved, they, they you know, yet young people don't come in with all the social skills, but finding someone who's in your tribe, so to speak, would, would be, uh, is good. I want to point out that we, we every, you know, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, my daughters were in young life, and uh, in fact, Mr. Bailey ran it. I think he might be doing it again as he's come back. And uh, I just bring up the example of the Harvest Crusade. I've been involved in the Harvest Crusade for a long time. Um, what if he were to post, hey, and it's coming up, I think, November something, um, that, uh, hey, go to the Harvest Crusade. Uh, if you've ever gone to the Harvest Crusade, there are Christians outside protesting against Greg Laurie's take on salvation. Uh, it could be that folks of, of non-faith or other faiths could be upset. So I don't want to 
curtail their creativity and, and make them feel subjective to a board. They are independent, as are booster clubs, though we take a great interest in them. Um, the other night, but I appreciate that, but to say that this board is deaf ears and is, is wholly, wholly inaccurate, and again, ignoring the facts of, of the situation, ignoring that, as this speaker knows, that it is state law, that we have no legislative power. I didn't, I said it then, and I'll say it again. I would not support a resolution damning the governor because it, we have no power to do so. And an individual, and in this type of governance, school district governance is very different from city council, particularly from the legislature. Are you getting a good shot there, lady? And um, it, it, we don't have legislative powers. We have implementation plow powers. So I read, a, I read a book, as many of you all do, it has 66 chapters in it. It's a, it's a book of faith. And I read the other night and I thought, oh my God, that is so true about America today that people, rather than taking sound facts, understanding what the facts are, caring to understand the facts, they want to have their ears tickled, is how it's said. And uh, I refuse, as an elected official that took an oath of office to pander to have anyone have their ears tickled because it's so they'll feel good. That doesn't mean we shouldn't communicate, and we should. The other night, uh, 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 Superintendent Hill and I attended the San Bernardino County Office of Education, Riverside County Office of Education's final, I mean, their fall meeting. Uh, it was excellent. There was a, a great crowd uh, from the nearly 100 districts that are combined between San Bernardino and and Riverside. Our speaker was uh, State Superintendent of Education, Tony Thurman. He talked about the money that's coming down from Sacramento to local school district, the 12 billion. And I particularly was interested in his conversation about the 7.9 billion. I'm looking forward to uh, Assistant Superintendent Power giving us a uh, better description, but it can be used discretionary. And uh, I like that because he talked about each each region of our state, each district, in fact, in our district, even uh, each area are, are different and, and have different uh, social, economic, uh, racial, uh, education levels, et cetera. And, and that as we want to do, and as Brown gave us, Governor Brown gave us back some, and it hopefully will begin to grow, local control. He also talked about state scores. And uh, while no one is pleased that they've gone down, he, he did point out that California was uh, higher in their scores and less falling than other populous states, uh, Florida, Texas, and Arizona. Uh, and I think that's a benefit and, and kudos to our, the state's uh, teaching and administrative uh, uh, you know, uh, contingent. He talked about the importance of ensuring that we target this money, uh, colleagues, to uh, Pacific areas, and he brought up, I thought it was a wonderful example, about the scores have improved and didn't go down as maybe expected for our foster youth. And I don't know if there's a more challenged group of students in America than foster youth. We know what they're up against and how they've done so well. So uh, I'm looking forward to finding out more about that. Um, let's see. He highly encouraged, and I, I think tonight is appropriate as we look at all this, uh, greater emphasis be done. Let me preface that. He said this is the time, and I think we've talked about this. There's always things you look for that in a crisis that can benefit. And he said this is the time to put emphasis on reinventing public education and the delivery of it. And he stressed that we, you know, he stressed two things. One, he stressed the social emotional which statewide has proven to be an, a strong need, uh, particularly after COVID, to understand what these young people and, and we all went through. Um, and and uh, I'm a pessimist sometimes when I read the headlines and how uh, Wunan in China has uh, quarantined again, 800,000 people. We all pray that it doesn't cross the shores. There are 30 virants he talked about that are coming, that are out there. Uh, he highly encouraged, let me say, that a, a re-emphasis and a greater emphasis on career technical training 
and he specifically talked about cybersecurity. There are 1.4 million jobs open right now at different levels for that. He commended, uh, as Ms. Allaby said, it's not easy to be a school board member. You don't have the legislative. You are implementers of dictates that uh, sometimes I agree with, sometimes I don't, but it isn't important. Uh, what my opinion is up here, it's, it would be injustice to give my personal opinion on certain things that are mandates. Particularly, it would be an injustice to the oath I took, which I will not, uh, if it ever becomes something against my own personal principles, I otherwise wouldn't uh, avoid. He said that anyone can hold the helm when the sea is calm, but it takes effective leadership to move forward when the waves uh, come and we are tested, when the storms prevail. And uh, I was very impressed with what he had to do, and I was very impressed of his attendance. I do also want to thank President Shields, uh, Mossbacher, and Rick for being here tonight. Your input is extremely important to us. I also want to just comment on my young colleague to my left. Uh, he said he asked me questions all the time. I learned from those two. I think any university that accepts this young gentleman to their campus will improve that campus tremendously. He is uh, extremely compassionate about education and, and even more so, if you get to know Abby, even more about people and about those that have challenges and uh, as you can see from his comments. I really enjoyed having you up here, young man. I, I thank you for your personal relationship with me. I enjoyed lunch with you so much that day, and I wish you just God's blessing as, as you move forward. And I know you'll do terrific. And he is not going off the board. He's just going up sitting here. He, the other two young ladies are still our board members and very involved with input. And again, Abby, I, trustee ready, I learned from you as much as you may have garnered a few things from me. So thank you for your service, young man. Thank you. Mr. Kinnear. Thank you. Uh, I, too, echo uh, comments about you, Mr. Reddy. You didn't take too much time tonight. Your comments were appreciated. They were thorough. Uh, we all listened, and, uh, and, and I think we all learned. You know, uh, I, I don't know Mrs. Murray, uh, but I know many of our other activities directors. And, and the words you use to describe Mrs. Murray also describe uh, the activities directors that I know throughout RUSD. Uh, they're very appropriate, they're very deserving, and uh, my hat is off to, uh, to, to Mrs. Murray and to uh, all of our student activities directors. Uh, just two quick items. Uh, along with uh, Superintendent Hill, I attended LULAC's Hispanic Heritage Celebration, and I, I particularly enjoyed hearing three of our Riverside County judges discuss their career pathways and judicial experiences. As a product of RUSD, it's always special to listen to Judge Hernandez. Uh, Judge Hernandez uh, represents our community very well. He's very articulate with his messages. I was pleased and, and, uh, and also proud to, uh, to see the participation of North students at that event. Uh, a special thanks to, to Mrs. Gonzalez, if you'd pass that on, and to the North Mecha advisors and students who, who attended. Finally, a, a big uh, thanks and congratulations to Reef and the district and school staff uh, and students who supported them in their recent bike race and, and fundraiser. Uh, no, I didn't ride a bicycle in the fundraiser, but I was impressed with the, the crowd and the participants. Nice job, Reef. And I also thank Arlington cheerleaders, so if you'd pass that on, uh, who made the event for Reef an even better event. Thanks, Mr. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Kinnear. Um, Dr. Farouk. Thank you, President Lee, and I want to begin by echoing the sentiments from my colleagues with our student board member, Reddy. I really appreciate your passion, your sincerity, and uh, you, as other speakers have attested also, you're a great uh, representative for your student population. So continue to keep us posted on your future and success. So thank you. Uh, I just wanted to make uh, really just two other broader comments. Uh, I know that 
Uh, we've already you know, been aware about uh, our data at the local level to seeing the impacts uh, from the, the pandemic, but I know that the state and the national data has been released and it's obviously uh, very uh, alarming and concerning. And I hope that th this is an opportunity for us really to engage more with regional collaboration, best practices, and feel some sense of solidarity within this in industry because uh, solutions and efforts as, as well intentioned as they are from all of us trying to, to uh, write this ship for the students, the more ideas that we, uh, broader ideas of the sandbox that we're able to ascertain uh, for the sake of wherever ide good ideas can come from uh, is very, very critical and time is of the essence for our, our, our children and our students. Uh, the, the last thing I just wanted to mention was about the state of the district and I think it's, it, it's very important to have that perspective and context. We live this you know, on a regular basis, but I think it's good to be able to have some perspective about wh where we're headed, what investments are being made. And I think it also, to me, is a, a, a real testament to just how difficult and complex it is to run a district of this size, uh, if, you know, 50 schools, 5,000 employees, and uh, all of the different dynamics um, in the, uh, with the, commu the community and uh, the environment that we're, we're in. And we're very, very fortunate to have a superintendent who's deeply dedicated, uh, Superintendent Hill. So uh, thank you uh, for your, your uh, tireless leadership and, and sincerity and all this. Uh, and the last thing I'll just say r related to the State of the District comments is I think this is also an area where our engagement with the community can be very important because we, the public schools need that engagement and support, whether it's with career opportunities for our students, whether uh, it's arts and, and VAPA, all kinds of areas. And I think the fact that we're kind of putting out there about the foundation and the role that that can play uh, at the State of the District is another w way that I'm very optimistic and encouraged to see that these are mechanisms that we can continue to get a lot of support from the community. So uh, thank you, President Lee. Those are my comments. All right, thank you, Dr. Farouk. Uh, that'll conclude board member comments this evening. We'll move on to item J, which is Board of Education Subcommittee reports. Um, we, we did bring back some subcommittees, either ad hoc or otherwise, um, because there's just so much work going on, we wanted to get ahead of it. Uh, so we will first hear from a subcommittee meeting that was held on October 11th for uh, the Memorials Naming of Schools Facilities Board subcommittee, and I think Dr. Farouk is going to provide a summary. Thank you, President Lee. I'm going to just give a brief overview. There were uh, five re uh, requests uh, about naming different facilities. I had the pleasure to serve on this committee with Trustee Kinnear. And so happy to defer to him also if, if, these, um, if these notes do not reflect the full intention of what occurred in that meeting. Uh, so the first one was a request about uh, naming uh, a school facilities consideration for the Harada family. And so this committee, the, our committee reviewed an application uh, received to rename Highland Elementary School after the Harada family and provided background and history about the family. Uh, the principal, Donna Dorsey, shared that she met with staff, PTA, ELAC, and parents to discuss and obtain their input. Applicant Robin Whittington from the Riverside Museum Associates introduced Robin Peterson, and they both provided background information regarding the family and said they were encouraged uh, by a board member to submit the application to rename uh, Highland Elementary School. The committee recommended that the board uh, do broader community outreach process and for that to continue and then to submit the findings to the superintendent and then uh, bring that back to the full board uh, for next steps. The next uh, consideration of, of naming of school facilities was Gay Caroline. The committee reviewed the application from Sharon Lewis uh, to consider renaming uh, uh, an existing school uh, without specifying uh, a particular school, just the idea of having a, a school named after her, and provided history and background. Gay Caroline's son, Etienne Caroline, provided background and history about uh, some of her achievements and highlighted that she was an Eastside resident. The committee recommended that this application go forward to the superintendent to put together a process, again, for broader outreach to the community for input and uh, about the possibility of identifying a specific school for that consideration uh, for next steps. 
The third is uh, Lorenzo and Maria Trujillo, naming of school facilities consideration. This was an application received from Nancy Melendez uh, to name the new High Grove Two neighborhood school after Lorenzo and Maria Trujillo uh, and discuss some of the history of, of, from our community here. Applicant Nancy Melendez provided historical overview, achievements, and families involved in the community. Uh, the committee recommended that this application also go to the superintendent to put together a process for broader outreach to the community uh, and input. The next one is Grant Education Center naming of facilities. This was a request from a board member, uh, Trustee Hunt specifically, to rename facilities at the Grant Education Center and provided background information on the proposed individuals to be honored. One request was to rename the Grant Education Center in honor of Woody, Woody Rucker Hughes and Adrian Dell Roberts. The second request is to name the Rotunda alcoves in honor of Jesse Wall, Hazel Hawkins, Russell, Ophelia Valdez Yeager, and Barbara Kerr. The committee recommended that this request go forward to the superintendent to put together a process for broader outreach. It's consistent, very consistent process uh, on, on that response. Uh, the last one is uh, Susan Rainey, uh, Dr. Susan Rainey, dedication plaque. A uh, request from board member Trustee Hunt to honor former RUSD superintendent Dr. Susan Rainey by installing a dedication plaque and naming the, the district's office conference room number one. Uh, uh, the committee recommended that an a formal application be submitted just so that we are consistent with the process with other uh, requests of this nature uh, and go then go to the full board. Uh, for approval consideration. Trustee Kinnear, is there anything else you want to add? You know, I think you said it very, very well. Uh, I, uh, both uh, uh, Dr. Fruk and I uh, agree with uh, the importance of everybody who's being suggested uh, as it relates to, uh, to honoring them for what they've done for Riverside and uh, our community. I mean, there's no, no doubt in any of our minds the importance of of Woody Rucker Hughes, the importance of Del Roberts, the uh, importance of the Harada House to, uh, to, to, to our community. I, I think the overall concern that I personally have is the renaming of facilities. Uh, and that's a difficult one in, uh, in my mind's eye uh, as it relates to how do we, you know, should we rename High, uh, Highland? Should we? Rename a different. Should we rename Polly? Should we rename North? What should we rename? Uh, so renaming is one that that I, you know I need time to, uh, to to grapple with. I don't need time to grapple with the significance of the achievements of the people that were uh, that that were that were recommended. Uh, these are these are issues that uh, that I want to explore uh, more time. Uh, to talk with uh, with our superintendent and to talk with others about. I would just mention also that, again, this was all initiated basically to have broader district-wide community input on all of this, but uh, all of these names mentioned, f for us, th these are names that we're very familiar with, but we're not, do, for the sake of the meeting, we're not going to explain why these people were, are significant people, but I encourage the community to learn about them nonetheless. Thank you, President Lee. Mr. Reddy. I had a quick question on what is the occasion on, on like the, well, what was the reasoning behind looking into renaming certain schools, uh, rotundas and different areas of the RUSD campuses? Like what prompted a committee to be made about that? So the committee did not, the committee itself did not solicit the, the, these. Uh, the, the, there is a process for the public, an application, if they want to initiate the things of this nature, independent of, of us. We purely were receiving the, the, this information and just getting guidance on what we thought and which w our general consensus on everything was. It needs to get input from the broader community. Uh, but though some of the ones specifically mentioned were from Trustee Hans. So I don't know if he wants to speak to to that, yeah. Thank you for that, that question. Riverside is a, I think, 140-year-old, Riverside Unified is 140-year-old district. Um, we have around 50 campuses. We are a strong, we're a district that uh, 
prides itself, and, and rightly so, in being diverse and being the first large school district in the United States to voluntarily desegregate. And of those 50, 50 campuses, one is named after an African American, one is named after an Hispanic, and three are named after women. That's 10%. That doesn't really reflect who we are. I recommended Highland because Highland is a, a name, and it was, I'm sure, done because UCR picked Highlanders. Um, Grant is, even if it was named after President Grant, it isn't, uh, doesn't describe. So I, I believe it's time after 140 years where our uh, policy before was to name schools after presidents, poets, and writers. And this board changed that to essentially, I don't have the exact in, my, in front of me, Abby, that uh, to recognize education leaders, civil rights leaders, leaders of uh, promotion of, of uh, furtherance of, of a community. And that may be a national, international, but I think local. Um, on Dr. Rainey, I, I, I don't think that's a, I think her recognition, she would be the first employee, I believe, ever recommended. Is that, well, it, she would be among the first. I don't know if there is. Maxine Frost and Art Littleworth. Oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, well, Art, Vanderzell. Well, they, they weren't, em, thank you, they, we are employees effectively, but, but I mean regular employees. And uh, rather than say board, boardroom, or not boardroom, conference room number one, I think Sue Rainey in their 10 years here when I think something like eight to 10 schools were established, uh, tremendous growth in the district to keep up with, passing Measure B and bringing AVID among other attributes is, uh, is worth recognizing. I know that I, we all feel I wish it could have been done before her passing, but it was started before then. So Abby, that is, it is my contention, and I'm not speaking for my colleagues because we haven't voted on anything, that recognition of great Riversiders, for one, or great Americans, uh, for another, uh, is, uh, surpasses the need to keep a name like Highland. Uh, I don't believe to Mr. Kinnear's observation. No, you don't touch the high schools. You don't touch the Washington Lincolns and those folks. But the Highlands and some of the others uh, I've used before, uh, William Henry Harrison, who served as our president for 31 days. And uh, they didn't name the school after William Henry Harrison. They named it Harrison because it was on Harrison Street. So I think it's an opportunity for this old proud district to, to recognize carefully, as, as I appreciate uh, Trustee Farouk outlining and the committee. Thank you, Mr. Kinnear, Trustee Kinnear. Uh, to recognize the diversity of our community and recognize the achievements of and the contributions of, of folks in this area and uh, throughout that have advanced civil rights and education and others. Thank you. Ms. Al, did you have something? Thank you. Just because Mr. Hunt brought it up, and while I will not probably be here to, to weigh in on it in the future, I do want you to be cognizant of the history of certain buildings. Grant is over 100 years old in its current location. And um, Highland, while it may not have importance to you, I'm sure historically has importance for the last 50 years of students who've gone there. Now you've got two schools coming up that don't have names that could be ostensibly named right now. You have an East Side neighborhood school that could ostensibly be named now, and you've got your school over that may or may not be happening over in the Highland. High so those, I think, are totally appropriate to come to an agreement about. But I really ask you to weigh the historic uh, importance for our community of just changing names willy-nilly. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alvey. Uh, next, we'll have an uh, update on board, sub board subcommittee for operations and facilities planning. And I believe Ms. Alvey is going to give us a summary of that meeting on October 12th. Thank you. Um, we had a very um, succinct 
Operations and Facilities Planning Board uh, Committee, Mr. Hunt and I basically reviewed three projects that are currently in CEQA. That's the East Side Neighborhood School, the STEM Education Center, and the John W. North High School. Um, what we wanted to do is just see where we were at the different stages of the CEQA process with each of these projects. And uh, we got a nice up update from uh, Mr. San Martin and his staff about where we are at each of those stages. And then we had a, a, li a little discussion about the field replacement at John W. North. The funding source is 100% deferred maintenance, and we saw renderings of the field design, and there, it's going to be a big improvement at North High School. So that's basically what we talked about. Very succinct, thank you. Uh, any board members have any questions? All right, um, we'll move on to the consent. Uh, all items under the consent calendar are considered to be routine. Uh, and will be enacted by the board in one motion. There will be no discussion on these items prior to a board vote unless members of the board request to have a specific item removed from the consent calendar. Uh, Mr. Kinnear, do we have any comment cards or public comment on the consent agenda? No. All right, so I'll, I'll move on and ask the board for a motion or any items to be pulled. Ms. Alvey? I would like to pull items six through 10. All right, there's a motion to pull items number six through 10. Um, do we have a motion to approve consent calendar minus items six through ten? So moved. Okay, so we got a motion to approve the consent calendar without items six through ten. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Dr. Farouk. Um, if board could please allow student board member ready to vote and then the rem rem remainder of us can vote. Mr. Kinnear, there we go. So that passes unanimously. Uh, Mrs. Alvey, item six through 10. Thank you. As is my, as, as is my way, um, Alcott has come to its final days and I wanted you to take a look at the finished project, uh, Measure O funded and the good way it turned out. Um, and I think Mr. San Martin has some slides for us. Thank you, Ms. Alvey. Good evening, President Lee, Superintendent, and Board of Trustees. Uh, we're excited and proud tonight to provide you with uh, an update on the completion of the Alcott Elementary School Measure O project and recommend the Board of Trustees to approve the filing of the project's notice of completions. A little bit about uh, Alcott. Luisa May Alcott Elementary School was built in 1961 with, tw with 23 classrooms. Today, the school has 36 classrooms with over 650 student enrollment. The project started construction on May 2021 and with a budget of $23 million and funded with Measure O. The scope of work completed included a brand new 18,000 square foot, 10 classroom, two story building, the removal of 11 age portable buildings and the relocation of four portables. And you can see here on this slide, the location of those, those uh, 14 portables where they were located. The project also included a new kindergarten playground and equipment, ADA upgrades, upgrades to site utilities and infrastructure, modernization, new landscape and fencing, and many other site improvements. These slides here um, that I'm gonna go through fairly quick, just show some examples of uh, what the work that has been completed at Alcott. Let's see here. All right, so here, this is a photo of the two-story building. This is a design from DLR Architects. And one of the highlights here, this is a before and after photo, the before photos on the, on the lower level, on the lower side of the, the slide here. But you can see this beautiful building that shows um, just the artistic work that was done on the railing on, on the second floor. You can see some examples of the playground equipment and the seating areas, and just a very, very neat uh, brand new building that has changed the campus overall. This next slide are before and after photos of some classroom wings, some hard courts, uh, staff parking, some building renovations. You can see from, from Central Street now, the, the new sign of the Alcott Elementary School, very uh, proudly, proud, proudly uh, showing off the school name, and then some, a photo here of the before and after of the front of the school with some site improvements. 
This next slide and last slide here is uh, just an example of one of the classrooms that was renovated and modernized. You can see the finishes with the brand new carpeting, uh, new ceiling tiles, new LED, light, LED lighting, uh, new casework, and then in between the walls that you really can see some mug breaks with electrical power, data, and mechanical systems. The, the other slide shows an example of the, of the drought tolerant uh, landscape that was added also in between existing buildings. So we just wanted to share just a few slides of the work that's, that took place at Alcott. And uh, I just wanted to also thank our partners, our staff, uh, and our Board of Education for making this project happen. Thank you, Ms. Elvi. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. San Martin. Um, so if it's okay with you, uh, Mr. Lee, um, this is my, one of my elementary schools that I went to. And before this addition that was just done through Measure O Money, it did look very similar to when I was there in second grade. But I will say that uh, this is now a, a nice new modern school and well-deserved of that uh, update. And I would like to move for approval of items six through 10. Thank you, Mrs. Alavi. Um, do I have a second? Uh, Mr. Hunt, thank you for the second. Please allow um, board member Reddy to vote. Um, sure, sure, sure. I, I appreciate very much uh, Assistant Superintendent and Superintendent for the presentation tonight. Thank you, Mrs. Alavi, for ensuring that it was pre-prepared. Um, and uh, I just want to stress again, I would, I would like to see, I think Polly did it, Nord's going to do it, to put the year next to where it says Alcott Elementary, EST period, the year it's founded. I think it's good for our, peop our citizens to know how much uh, how old some of these schools are and the investment they made has brought it up. So, um, and I, I would very much like, and I'm sure all of you would, that, to include a link on our website for all the Measure O products and let the community, that uh, our USD community from High Grove to Lake Matthews know where their money went and, and how it's being improved, uh, removing those modulars particularly. But thank you, Mr. Lee, for allowing me that. You're welcome. All right, board members, please vote. All right, that, that, that passes unanimously as well. So that concludes the consent agenda. So we'll move on to the action calendar, item number one. Uh, first action item tonight is the approval of resolution number 2022-23-47 in support of Proposition 28, the Arts and Music Education Initiative. Um, I think Ms. Hill, our superintendent, is going to introduce this item and read the resolution okay uh, <laughs> yes mr lee um staff has worked on a uh at the direction of the board has worked on a resolution for the board to consider in support of proposition 28 and i'll read it whereas arts education has always been a priority for california with specific requirements for public schools outlined in state law Whereas a lack of resources and a shortage of qualified teachers in the various arts disciplines have created challenges for schools in turning the promise of arts education into reality. Whereas this November, California voters have a historic opportunity to make lasting change by ensuring all California students have access to the arts. Proposition 28, which will be on the statewide general election ballot on November 8, 2022, and would dedicate more than $900 million in additional funding for arts and music education in public schools. Whereas Proposition 28 will not raise taxes on California residents and the funding provided for arts education will be in addition to the state funding currently provided to California public schools. The measure includes strong accountability and transparency measures, including annual report public reports to verify that the funds are spent as intended. Whereas when students take art classes, they benefit in many ways. Numerous studies have demonstrated the importance of arts and music education in the development of children and their success in school and life. Arts and music education improves cognitive development, reasoning and language acquisition. It correlates with higher student achievement in reading and math 
and it leads to increased school attendance. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Riverside Unified School District Board of Education supports Proposition 28, the Arts and Music Education and Public Schools Initiative, because arts and music play a critical role in helping students learn, develop, and achieve in school and later in life by helping them to learn and think both creatively and critically passed and adopted by the Board of Education of the Riverside Unified School District at its regular meeting held on October 27, 2022. Thank you, Superintendent Hill. Um, Mrs. Alavi. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to the board for being willing to uh, entertain this resolution. Um, as you know, over the years, especially since I've been on the board, it's been very clear that there's there's a limitation to uh, the school day, to how much you can fit into a school, a school day. And when we went through No Child Left Behind, there was just no room for arts, and arts took a real beating. It also takes a beating when you have an economic downturn, and you have to let things go, and you have to cut ties. And every time you do that, every time you cut the arts, you go backwards steps. You know, uh, the band takes a hit, the choirs take a hit, the art le uh, classes take a hit, uh, you, you drop dance, you, you drop ceramics. And this resolution will ensure that there's a dedicated stream of funding that which will keep those classes in place even as times go up and down. So I uh, appreciate it. I certainly encourage you to pass this and I will make a motion when that time comes. Thank you, Mrs. Alvey. Dr. Farouk? Thank you, President Lee. Uh, you know, I think it's very rare and it's a testament to the, the, the power of this resolution that there's not even a recorded opposition. I mean, how often does you see something like that happen in a statewide proposition? So I think it's an extraordinary thing. Um, to me, this is kind of like metaphorically like a Kathy Alavi you know, amendment kind of thing, because just as when the district, you know, had downtime and you were really the, the uh, champion to making sure arts gets preserved, this kind of enshrines your, you know, your spirit at a state level. So um, I'll d defer to you on the motion, but just wanted to acknowledge our appreciation for you. Mr. Reddy. So I just wanted to provide a quick thing. Uh, when we learned about this in our government class and we were doing a mock election for the ballot, uh, the moment we learned about this, the first thing that came to my mind was uh, Miss Alavi, Trustee Alavi, and how she always, educate, she always advocates for arts in our school. Um, it was just a comment, and not, nothing personal or a question. But yeah, thank you. Uh, second to the motion, maybe? You can make a comment. I just was asking Mr. Reddy if he's got a second to the motion. Go ahead, Mr. Hunt. Okay, yes. Um, well, both of my colleagues to the left and the right said it best, and I'm, uh, I, I think it's wonderful through the state of California that there is no opposition, that uh, what our colleague to my far right has always advocated that arts are so important to uh, education, to the uh, application, and to way helping children develop their minds. And uh, while some of us don't have artistic abilities, I remember fondly those times. So, and I think, and I feel great that it, this is uh, something that's happening statewide and, and about this resolution that my dear friend and colleague, Mrs. Alavi is, uh, this is sort of, I don't come up with a better one, Kathy, I'm sorry, but this is sort of like a, a tombstone, or we used to call it Louisiana. Uh, uh, yeah, a bridge bill when governors would always push a bill forward that would uh, have their name on it. There's uh, the Jimmy Long uh, bridge that doesn't even have roads leading to it, but there would be roads leading to this that will advance California education. And I'm very proud to allow uh, Mrs. Alavi uh, for, uh, push this forward. Mr. Kinnear. Yeah, our minutes should reflect there's no public comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks for the reminder. All right. Do I have a second? I second that motion. Thank you, Board Member Reddy. Please vote after Mr. Reddy. Thank you. All right, that motion carries. We'll get that resolution posted. 
Uh, how do we intend to get this out to our community? The election is, what, two weeks away? Uh, how do we some, intend uh, to do that, sir? Some uh, ground rules on that, but uh, Ms. Ms. Hill, did you want to share what yes. the plan is after today? Sure I have a plan. All right. <laughs> Good evening. We'll be posting it on social media widely after tonight. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Item number two on our action calendar is uh, an action item for the approval of resolution number 2022-23-46, uh, adopting uh, the amended conflict of interest code. Um, Ms. Hill. Uh, yes, Mr. Lee. Uh, this is a um, regular revision that we have to do to the conflict of interest code just to make sure that the proper uh, titles are listed for people who have to do a Form 700 filing. Um, so it's routine business. It just updates all the titles that have to be um, listed so that people are notified that they file a 700 form. Okay. Um, Mr. Kinnear, do we have any public comment? No public comments. Do, does the board have any questions or comments for staff prior to entertaining a motion? Dr. Farouk? I'll, I'll motion to approve. Motion to second. approve by Dr. Farouk, a second by Mrs. Alavi. Uh, if there's no further comment, please vote. All right, that passes uh, unanimously. I'll move item on to item number three. Um, this item is the approval of resolution number 2022-23-44, authorizing the issuance of bonds for Community Facilities District CFD number uh, 37. Uh, at this time, she's already here, I'm inviting Assistant Superintendent Power to present the item. Yes, good evening, President Lee, Superintendent Hill, and members of the board. As you just noted, this action item is to authorize the issuance of bonds for Community Facilities District Number 37. The resolution is 2022-23-44. The sale of the bonds will provide approximately $1.5 million to the district. And tonight we have with us Mr. Adam Bauer, CEO and President of Fieldman Rollapp and Associates to provide information related to the CFD and the bond sale. Great, thank you. Good evening, and Mr. Bauer. Thank you, good evening too. So what you'll notice on a cover are two columns. One says tax exempt, one says taxable. That's a little bit different than what you've seen on a lot of your other bond issuances. And one of the entities that's included in the CFD um, was not able to certify that to spend the money within that three year time period. And so they have a longer window to do that by having taxable bonds um, in there. You're funded first, so it doesn't, it just erodes their other funding, not your funding. Um, on this, uh, back to that point though, uh, rates have gone up quite a bit since we've last spoken. I think I was in front of you many times saying they've never been this low, they keep being this low. That's not the case now. They're slightly above average right now when you go back about 15 years. And that's what that chart tries to demonstrate there. And we've included the tax exempt chart, which is the MMD, and the taxable chart, which is the uh, treasury there in the far right. And just wanna, this slide is a reminder of why you're doing this and why you spend all this time on these CFDs. Without the CFDs, these are the fees that you'd collect. You get approximately two thirds in addition to that by doing these CFDs. And that's a, a very good amount when you compare it to other districts out there. On this chart, uh, we formed a CFD in 2021. We had a not to exceed authorization of 9.5 million, which might be a little confusing because now we're asking you to look at a $7 million number. When we formed the CFDs, we look at the most optimistic scenario and try to make sure that that, num that authorization number doesn't limit us in the future. And it turns out rates have gone up, they've built a little sooner than we expected, and so we're looking for a low lower amount now, not the full 9.5 million. Now you're probably looking at me saying, you know, there's a lot of things going on in the housing market and why is this, why would we be doing this right now? And I think that bottom bullet point gets to that, is there's 90 units expected within this development 
and there's been 90 building permits issued. So they're all under construction. But another thing that's really important to look at right now is that half of those have closed individual homeowners. One, if you, if you go back the last 10 years, builders were building like five homes, selling them, then, then building five homes and selling them. There wasn't a disconnect between permits and closing by a very large degree, but that's changed. Now they're pulling a whole lot of building permits before they close. But in this case, we didn't do anything and so we had to 45 closed. That last number is a number the builders really want you to focus on, but it's kind of meaningless. Uh, these are homes that are under construction that a homeowner or a potential homeowner put a very small deposit on, kind of like buying an electric car, and uh, like $150, put your deposit down. When your car's available, you're going to buy it. That's kind of what this is like. Uh, they might be picking out some things. They might you know, have some input in it, but they can walk away very easily. So we really discount that number. But it, it is, a, it is a, a fact. We do disclose it in your um, offering statement, but no, not nearly as meaningful as those other numbers on there. Just gives you some idea of the location. Uh, we have uh, Miller Middle School, Martin Luther King High, and then I'm having trouble reading the blue tech. Mark Twain, Mark Twain Elementary. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then here's, you know, it feels like we've tried to put as many numbers as we could on a page. Uh, but to the far right is that 110 coverage I've talked to you a bit about, and that means the revenue is expected to be 10% more than the bonds. And then in there, you can see you're funding RUSD and city facilities on a tax exempt basis and the water agency facilities are expected to be done on a taxable basis. And then you see all your other components that I've shown you in the past. Our schedule is, uh, we have this item before you this evening. We have several calls tomorrow to wrap up our due diligence efforts. And then we hope to print that preliminary official statement on Halloween. That should allow us to be in the bond market as early as November 8th and close just a little before Thanksgiving. So that's our last slide. Uh, but I'm also available, and we also have Murnal Shaw, who works on a transaction as well, available for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Bauer. Any questions from the board? I mean, sorry, any public comment before we talk to the board? No comments. Does the board have any questions for, for staff or Mr. Bauer or Ms. Shaw? I recommend motion to approve. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Dr. Farouk. Do you have a second? I second. Thank you, Mr. Reddy. Uh, board, please vote. All right, that, that resolution carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, item, item number four, um, this is an approval, ask, uh, consideration for approval of resolution number 2022-23-34 to declare the intention in resolution number 2022-23-35 to declare necessity of the formation of CFD number 40. At this time, I'll invite uh, Superintendent, uh, Assistant Superintendent San Martin to present this item. Good evening again. Um, this item, we're going to ask Mr. Adam Bowers again to come up and to walk us through the presentation. He's going to go through the specifics of the request to form uh, Community Facilities District number 40 and then walk us through the steps of the next uh, or the beginning phases of the proceedings. For tonight, the, the board in this item is we're requesting the board to take action on two resolutions, as Mr. Lee mentioned. And these are the first uh, steps to initiate the formation of CFD 40. As Mr. Adams Bowers mentioned, we also have in the audience our legal counsel from BBK, Ms. Runal Shah, who's here for also to answer any specific questions that you may have. Thank you. Great. And uh, just like the bond sale is kind of the end of the process, this is the very beginning of the process, and we have a resolution of intention this evening. And if we can go to the next slide. Uh, we're looking at items to be financed here, and the first one, and as I've described you in the past, gets priority. That's Riverside Unified School District. But then we also have Western Municipal Water District, and then two county, uh, project, two county items. Uh, it's relatively rare that we've had county in here, but they're becoming more active in considering this. And so the developers wanted them in on this one. This is a step that Ms. Shaw has walked you through before, and we can um, stop and go through the details if you need it. But you're in that first phase few of these as you look at your documents this evening. And on this chart, we tried to give you some kind of, we had a mail out when we did that instead of the, the operations committee, I, I think back in February, we did a mail out, but we had made some changes from them. So you see the mail out column in that table. 
and in the current on the far right there. And that is as the developer continued to move forward, they changed their product to mix and um, changed their pricing quite a bit along the way. And so this was able to generate or potentially generate more funds than they had originally projected. And so what we did was each one of these items, we showed you mail out amount and current amount, because we always want to show you when we have something different than what we've showed you um, previously. The developers, Pulte Homes, they're a relatively large builder. Uh, I believe they're nationwide. And then you have your traditional team listed there, there below that's worked, with you, that's worked with you a long time. Uh, this gives you some idea of the location, Lake Matthews Elementary, Middle, Miller Middle School, and then Arlington High School. And it's broke out, broken out into four zones. Uh, this evening is your first item. And then on December 15th, we'll be back with that resolution of formation. And then that second reading of the ordinance, which is much quicker on January 15th. And we're both available for any more questions. Thank you, Mr. Bauer. Any public comment, Mr. Kinnear? No All right, so if there's no public comment, I'll open it up to the board for any questions or a motion. Move to approve. I second that. All right, we have a motion to approve by Mr. Kinnear and a second by Mr. Reddy. Uh, board members, please vote. All right, that carries. Thank you, staff. Thank you, Mr. Bauer. Thank you, Ms. Shaw. Um, item number five, uh, this action item is for the board to consider a new board policy 3523 regarding electronic signatures. Uh, Assistant Superintendent Power, I think, has a brief presentation for us. Yes, good evening again. So tonight I am presenting to you the first read of a new optional board policy on electronic signatures. This policy would protect the district in that it authorizes digital signatures um, as authorized by law and enforces that electronic signatures must comply with legal requirements, including that the signature is unique to the person using it and it's capable of verification amongst other requirements. Um, this board policy is um, the one that's recommended by the California School Board Association. And tonight, if the board chooses, uh, you can take action to approve the board policy. Is there any public comment, Mr. Kinnear? No public comment. Dr. Farouk? Thank you, President Lee. I just have one question, uh, and just to more, just to affirm that the this is a standard CSBA agreement to comply with the uh, revised law. That there, you're not there's no discretionary areas that you're uh, putting into perspectives on that. Correct. Correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Uh, Assistant Superintendent, it will still require motions and approval of the board to apply these signatures, isn't it? Yes, okay. all of the same policies where you authorize who can sign documents and things still apply, yes. All right, and that, thank you very much, appreciate that. Ms. Alvey. Thank you, it's a small point, but um, the way it's positioned in our notebook doesn't look like our other, our other uh, policies. I don't think it's set up in the same format. Oh, okay, we'll look into that. I, I, do you guys see that in red? It doesn't look like our other policies. I'm just saying that it needs to be, uh, to look like the other policies. It's, it doesn't have the same kind of headline, doesn't have the same kind of but to be, but I have no problem with the content. And that's what I was gonna say is that's, it, it, I think it is good for just to be consistent, but that, that does not reflect the, the content of right. the app. Right, it does not. Okay, no taken, thank you. If I may, Mrs. Alvey, I think this is the uh, format when, when we go on the electronic platform and print it out from there, that's the format that you're seeing. But we'll make sure that on any, if there's a, a paper version that it matches the others. I like that. Okay, thank you, Ms. Alvey. Okay. Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee, I'd like that to be the superintendent's explanation, clarification to be part of the motion that it, it, I'm gonna miss you, Kathy, for catching this all the time, um, that it does align with our USD's uh, uh, outline of policies. And uh, if it comes back here for that, or just by the administrator, I mean, the um, executive, which would be you and the, the vice president, just to make sure it aligns, I'd, I'd appreciate that. 
Yeah, I think as long as the content's the same, how it's arranged it's on the paper, it's, we can have staff do that. Um, do I have a motion to approve? So a motion moved. to approve. Oh, second. All right, uh, Ms. Dr. Farouk and Ms. Alvey for the second. Uh, after Mr. Reddy, please vote. All right, that passes unanimously as well. Um, last item on the action agenda this evening, and then we'll take a 10 minute recess. Yes, Mr. Kinnear. Uh, is, is it possible to do a second reading I, uh, on this item so that, that we can just take care of this business and get it off our plate? Which one are you talking, the one uh, that we all just voted uh, on? Authorized, uh, the, the, the change in policy authorizing the signature. If we can do two readings at one. We, we just voted. So, I mean, I, th I don't think we can do that. You could bring it back. I, we I, voted I, to adopt it in one, in, in one motion. Yeah. We, we voted to adopt it in one motion. Oh, we did. Yes. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. I'm done. But when it comes back, we can double check. So maybe, can, maybe if the board, uh, if the staff could put that in a, a mail out, the um, adopted version and, and the correct formatting so we can make sure we got it right. All right, item number six. Um, is a recommendation to uh, an MOU that was created an increase of health and welfare cap for district employees, uh, Assistant Superintendent Yabara, um, and I'm not sure if uh, Ms. Power is going to also take this one, but go ahead. Thank you. I'll just wait for the presentation. So this is uh, to request approval by the board for a an increase to the health and welfare cap that the district pays on behalf of our employees. Also attached to the agenda are memorandums of understanding with the Riverside City Teachers Association as well as the Classified School Employees Association and the disclosures of collective bargaining that demonstrate the financial impact and the affordability. We also um, submitted those disclosures to the Riverside County Off Office of Education and they have confirmed that we can afford the increase and have submitted letters um, to the board president and superintendent hill here you can see that the total cost of the increase is about five million dollars annually um, you can see that the breakdown uh, by by group so classified certificated and management and that the increase applies to about 3,000 of, of our employees who are enrolled in a health and welfare plan. Here you see the various options that we offer to our employees, uh, the total cost of each option, and the uh, new employer cost if this increase is approved. Uh, so the, the employer cost would be 14,106, that would be our cap. And we would have the EPO as a free option to our employees, both the regular EPO as well as the high deductible EPO. So this is a great option for our employees to have zero out-of-pocket costs for a health and welfare plan for them and their families. And then finally, a commercial to let you all know that we are in open enrollment right now and that open enrollment closes November 4th. And with that, I will be happy to take any questions. Do you have any comments from the public, Mr. Kinnear? No comment. Okay, I'll open it up to the board for any questions or for a motion. Mr. Hunt. Th thank you, Mr. Lee. Can we go back to, with the staff go back to that slide that had the different plans, just so I can ask this question? What is the difference, Ms. Power, between, well, I'll, go, I'll wait for it to be put up there. Next one. Next one. Thank you. No, next one. I apologize. Next one. What's the difference between the RUSD EPO and the high deductible EPO? As far as, I mean, it's $3,000 difference, but what does that mean? Yeah, that means that um, employees enrolled in that plan have a higher deductible when they visit the doctor. And so therefore the plan is less expensive overall. And it's less expensive to them as well then? Yes. So usually I would think we see younger folks that don't have as many creaky problems as us older folks do picking this, okay. Yes. And, uh, and, we, um, and Kaiser went up, is that correct? Yes, Kaiser went up. 
by about 6% okay. over last year. All right. Thank you, Mr. Lee. I appreciate the allowance. Any other questions or comments from the board? If not, I'll entertain a motion. A motion by second. Mr. Hunt, a second by Mrs. Allaby. Uh, board, board, please vote after Mr. Reddy. All right, that passes unanimously as well. All right, thank you, board. Thank you, audience. We're going to take a 10-minute break and then come back and uh, dive into the report and discussion part of the agenda.
Thanks for a little bit of extra time so we could refuel. All right, if everybody could get to their seats, we'll get started. We have three more items, I believe, for this evening. All reports from staff. Uh, our first report tonight is an update on the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program, ELOP. Uh, and we'll have Dr. DeAnda start this presentation. Thank you. Good evening, Board President Lee, Mrs. Hill, and esteemed board members. It is a pleasure to be here with you this evening to share our progress on the expansion of our after-school programs. The expansion and additional opportunities for RUSD's expanded learning programs have been made possible by the 2021 Assembly Bill 130, which has provided us with the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program, or ELOP, funding. The opportunity to enhance our expanded learning options aligns with all three of our board priorities. First, by providing a safe space for our students beyond the school day and school year, we can provide for the well-being of not just our students, but also our families who may be in need of such services. Student learning is impacted through the academic supports built into the program. And finally, we know that connecting with our community is vital to our success in this. For the past decade, this program has been staffed by our partners at the Boys and Girls Club of America. We have also been able to provide enrichment opportunities such as swim and the arts through partnerships with Riverside Arts Academy, Riverside Arts Museum, Tilden Coyle, Kiwanis, and the City of Riverside, just to name a few. Part of what you will hear tonight is the opportunity to increase these partnerships across our community to meet the needs and interests of our students and families. Prior to this school year, we had already had expanded learning programs in place at 20 elementary schools and six middle schools. And we have begun our expansion by adding six additional sites already this year. Next, our coordinator, Ms. Jerry Castro, will share the steps we have taken to fulfill the commitments since coming before you with a proposed plan back in May. So welcome, Mrs. Castro. <coughs> Good evening, Board President Lee, Board members, and Superintendent Hill. We would like to begin tonight with a brief overview of our funding. The Expanded Learning Program has offered hearts at 20 elementary sites and prime time at six middle school sites for over 15 years. This has been made possible by After School Safety and Education Grant, known as ACES. With the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program funding, we will be able, as staff allows, to increase the amount of student offerings at existing sites via additional spaces in hearts and prime time, as well as additional programming throughout the school year. We are proud and excited to be able to expand to all elementary and middle schools by 2024, while increasing services at all TK through sixth grade in-person schools. The requirements of the Expanded Learning Opportunity Program funding include starting with serving in-person students in grades TK through six, English learners, foster, and, and low SES students must be prioritized through the funding. We are required to offer these students a nine hour school day, which would include their six and a half hour instructional day and at least two and a half hours of expanded learning that includes both academic support and enrichment opportunities. A 10 to one ratio for grades TK and K and a 20 to one ratio for other grades. Our staff providing direct academic and enrichment supervisory services to our students during after school programming must meet the minimum LEA instructional aid qualifications. Finally, we must provide a program of 30 non-school days over the course of a year. As we look at our program metrics, I just want to remind us that in 1920, due to school closures, we did not conduct our family surveys. And because of the 
school year of 2021 being entirely virtual, we also did not do the similar surveys that they were accustomed to. Our existing ACES program takes part in an annual continuous quality improvement process, which is a requirement of the grant. The metrics used to align the existing process, as we move into ELOP, we will disaggregate data and adjust our metrics and goals accordingly. Our current attendance target is 85%. In the first two months of this year, we have 93.8% attendance rate this is encouraging when compared to 2021. We desire to build a highly engaging program that all children want to attend daily. As stated in May, we have monitored this via student attendance during the first two months of the program to establish a benchmark. It has been determined that we will continue to recruit line staff to meet the growing demands of the program. We are working with our partners, Boys and Girls Club, and recruiting our own expanded learning tutors as additional supports. Working together, our village will grow in order to meet the expanding needs of our after-school programs. The existing process requires annual surveys. In 2022, 98.3% of parents were satisfied as measured by the annual survey. In the boxes at the bottom of the screen, you can see some of the specific areas considered in the survey. This year, we will administer a survey for Hearts and Prime Time at the end of the first and second trimesters to better understand interests as well as to gather feedback to improve the program and gather a satisfaction level of participants. We will also continue our end of the year survey that is administered to guardians, teachers, and students, measuring the efficacy of the program's qualities as it relates to the intent of the ACES grant. Our HEARTS programs operate at 26 elementary sites. Newly added so far this year are Castleview, Woodcrest, Harrison, Rivera, and since creating this power, um, presentation for you tonight, Franklin and Taft. HEARTS partners with the Boys and Girls Club to provide a safe environment in which academic support, enrichment activities, and social emotional development occur every day. Our primetime programs operate at six middle school sites. Primetime employs RUSD expanded learning primetime tutors to support our students with their social emotional development, academic needs, and daily enrichment activities. With both programs, we keep in mind the needs of the students that we are servicing and the programs being offered at the school site. We do our best to place biliterate employees at schools with DLI programs to support the academic hour. We have revamped our systems and have increased the supports, to, supports for development, the, developing the employees to provide an engaging experience for our students. The programs that you're going to be seeing coming soon, of course, minus Franklin and Ta, um, Taft, because we just started on the 24th, are, are here, and this is going to be happening throughout the 2022-23 school year and the 24 school year. We continue to recruit employees for the line staff and work with Boys and Girls Club. We are on target to open all our elementary schools before winter break, as long as we have the employees to meet the staff and student ratios. We are currently working on a plan for Riverside STEM Academy, as they do have fifth and sixth graders, which is part of our ELOP funding. This has been an exciting time as it provides opportunities for ongoing collaboration with our educational partners. During the planning stage stages, input was sought from families, students, and staff in order to develop expansion actions for bo board consideration. Parents and staff expressed a desire to have the program at their home site. There was also interest in a variety of enrichment activities, including visual and performing arts, science, technology, engineering, math, and physical activities, as well as field trips. Next, we will show how through the support of our RUSD families, students, staff, and partners, this input has been put into action. 
When we think about the input from the community and the interests of the students, it is amazing to see the synergy that takes place between the school sites and our partnerships. Expanded Learning Programs has a long history of key foundational community partners that have been pillars in supporting our students and their families. This slide is reflective of some of our past partnerships that have remained active with RUSD and the partnerships that are currently supporting the well-being and engagement of our students. Our largest partnership with approximately 230 line staff serving our students and still recruiting for our soon to open sites is the Boys and Girls Club. Our partnership extends approximately 10 years and has grown in scope. We share curriculum and supports. We are looking forward to the future that hold, holds under ELOP. Over a decade ago, our amazing summer starting blocks program started with the Kiwanis Club of Riverside, RCC, Tilden, and Tilden Coyle to teach our littles to swim and save lives. This program has grown exponentially. We cannot extend enough gratitude to these founding partners and the city of Riverside for always coming along our programs to support our students. We just finished our fall primetime community pool visit at Islander Pool, and many of the students there were previous starting block participants. Additional after-school program offerings at some sites include music support through the Riverside Arts Academy, Big Brothers Big Sisters, the Little Bigs program, or otherwise known as the high school and elementary mentor and mentee program. UCR, UCEE, AmeriCorps Tutor Support, now known as the College Corps. Our STEM offerings include Creative Brain, RoboX1, Robotics Rotation, first through sixth grade, coming to all elementary sites. Lego STEM offerings, TK through sixth grade, coming in the winter, we are partnered with RUSD's very own ILE department. Amazon Future Engineers for our middle schools. Nutrition services, not only do they make sure every child in our program receives a super snack, but they have partnered with us to provide an engaging after school physical education curriculum and training program known as SPARKS. They also provide nutrition education and a gardening program. Transportation, our needs have grown. And the customer service that we receive from transportation is top notch. The communication and turnaround time from request to services is excellent. Social emotional. I think the picture on the bottom says, says it all for me. Um, this is a picture of our primetime students. Their Tosa, who's in charge of that program, went through a personal loss. And they were so concerned and were so grateful that she came back that they decorated the entire area just for her to show that she was going to be okay and that they were welcoming her back with open arms. So we wanted to begin the typical student experience in the after school program with this social emotional piece for, it all, for all our children. In the slide that, slides that follow, we will share how through art, academic time, physical activity, STEM, VAPA, student clubs and field trips, we provide many opportunities to build upon social and emotional skills. We currently practice community circles, utilize the Boys and Girls Club SEL lessons and leadership curriculum at various sites. And our SPARKS curriculum has an embedded character and ethics component. Currently, we have sites that are partnered with Big Brothers Big Sisters and provide the High School Bigs program, AKA Little Bigs. Our high school students are trained to mentor a heart student and do so once a week. The high school students serve as mentors to the elementary youth who are identified by teachers and counselors as needing increased social, emotional, and academic mentoring support. I have witnessed the power of this at Longfellow as a previous principal. And seeing our North students come back and give back just that one-to-one -one time makes such a difference. We are working on forming a partnership with Girls on the Run and are very excited to increase our offerings. This program is academic, community-driven, encourages physical activity, 
It brings in the parents, caregivers with parents, but with parent guides and giving them pointers. And it focuses on social, emotional, and physical learning. We also have a long-standing partnership with UCR, their college core tutors. These tutors work with our students as an additional academic support, helping to boost student confidence as well as achievement. Did you know that we have an art curriculum? We utilize standards-based curriculum for our after-school programs. It is an expectation that twice a week, students have the opportunity to gauge in an arts attack lesson. Our TOSAs have modified lessons to differentiate to meet the needs of our students. In this slide, we have included a few examples from a larger lesson. The lesson plans in this slide were mo modified by our TOSA from High Grove. There are examples of art from different school sites. But we also provide time for free expression, and our students across the district absolutely love working with modeling clay. We are looking forward to working with community partners to provide more experience for students to explore and showcase their artistic side. Our program requires an offering of a minimum of an hour of academic support. We do so by providing homework time and alternative academic activities for early finishers or students with no homework. Our TROSAs work with their school sites to directly align with the student and school needs. For example, at Bryant, a core knowledge distinguished school, there are grade level folders with specific assignments to support the needs of the students with extra practice by subject area if needed. And the school staff during the day, the teachers contribute to this to increase communication between the line staff, the TOSA, and the teachers to meet the needs. We work with the strengths of our staff to best meet the needs of the students. Our partners, Boys and Girls Club, work with us to strategically place staff in accordance with school needs programs when possible at our elementary schools. Our expanded learning primetime tutors offer the same support to our middle school students. Some of our sites have additional community partners that work with them to help with homework. As, you've, as we stated before, it is our mentorship programs through UCR and through the um, Big Brothers Big Sisters program. Our parent feedback indicates that academic hour is helpful and an appreciated component. And if you're ever there at pickup time, you're going to hear that comment. Thank you, did you finish your homework? And they, oh, that's the first thing they ask their kids. <laughs> and it's a, wonderful to hear that they're excited about that. Expanded learning programs provides 30 minute minimum of physical activity. This year, we were fortunate enough to have Nutrition Services Department partner with us and provided 29 of our sites with the SPARKS program. They trained our line staff in August and continue to support the implementation of this engaging skill-based curriculum. The kids are active and they are participating. The lessons are built for after-school programs, so they are geared towards our setting. As we move forward, we would like to expand our intramural offerings. Currently, we have a few schools that play each other in soccer. We will be seeking community input at the end of the trimester and move forward in accordance with that input. Our ELOP offering for our community partner, Creative Brain, has begun. We started with robotics and the coding of the robot. This offering is called RoboX1. This is a first through sixth grade offering, and I cannot thank our site TOSAs and admin enough for their support. We are currently at six sites and will rotate in a few days to another six schools. Thanks to the amazing leadership, vision, and support of the ILE team, our program has been able to offer STEM opportunities to our students in the past. However, going forward, we have a robust plan that creates a TK through eighth grade pathway we are set for training in the winter and roll out by spring for TK through sixth grade Lego STEM offering. This will provide coding and engineering experience to our students. We also provide all sites, elementary and middle, the option of choosing to provide a coding club for all students sponsored by Girls That Code. This year, we are partnering with ILE to provide middle schools the option of an after-school program computer science fundamentals course. This program is brought to us by Amazon Future Engineers Project STEM. 
Through these programs, our students not only are building problem solving, collaboration, and language skills, but they are becoming world ready. We offer a wide variety of clubs and VAPA offerings. Our program utilizes student and parent survey input and student leadership to create club offerings in the after school programs. Sites may not offer the same clubs as it is based on student input and staff availability. We have cheer, sports clubs, cooking, gardening, crafting, gaming, Lego, photography, and many more. Our VAPA offerings extend from the community partners at various school sites like Riverside Arts Academy, offering extended band and choir. We also provide other musical offerings if staffing and reasonable student interest exists. During summer program, RUSD continued with Starting Blocks program, a long-standing and valued life-saving experience for our littles. This fall, we brought back the primetime tradition of water safety and outdoor recreation. All six of our middle school programs visited Island Pool, and they had a blast. This year, in accordance with RUSD safety guidelines and protocols, we will offer standards-based experience for our students. School sites have the option of submitting field trip requests to meet the needs of their particular programs. We also encourage sites to provide activities at the school site that provide alternatives to field trips. Our program strives to provide an enriching experience that our students, staff, and families are excited and proud to be a part of. Under ELOP, we will offer 30 additional nine hour optional days for elementary students. The 30 and the nine are the minimum. To meet this requirement and the needs of families, we have sent out surveys to guardians, boys and girls club staff, classified and certificated to determine optimal days to extend these offerings. We are hosting our first exploration days on November 3rd and 4th, which was the number one choice from all groups surveyed. We have already begun planning for the spring break offering and the summer program. We are collaborating with partners to provide engaging options that meet the interests and needs of our students and their guardians. As we move towards the spring, our exploration days will include offerings that introduce various RUSD pathways as we continue to assist our students to be world ready. We know that expanded learning opportunities provide students with experience that address equity gaps in our community. We are determined to close linguistic gaps due to poverty by providing all students with hands-on experiences that embody RUSD's portrait of a graduate to know, act, think, and be. Thank you for your time this evening. We will now turn it over to public comment and then board questions. Thank you. Uh, any no comments. All right, so we'll go on to board member questions and comments. Um, Mr. Hunt and then Mrs. Alavi. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Dr. Castro and everyone, thank you for that presentation. I just want to, I was looking at the, uh, and, and I love all the programs and, and how you all have advanced them, and it's good to see you again, Dr. Castro. And I uh, appreciate, as I know we all do, I'm just trying to find the page, the um, the sponsorships, the RAM and Tilden Coyle, I love their swim program, the, and the Kiwanians have been involved all these years. I just want to ask the superintendent to have her staff look at others who might not know about these programs that they might want to get involved, like the architects and the construction managers that are making millions off of this district, uh, whoever our facility staff is using to replace the turf. That is, that is a million dollars at each school. Um, schools first and the other, I'll, I'll tour, they're wonderful, but maybe be involved. Um, what's, what's our transportation, uh, what's our bus company? It's not schools first, is it schools first? Students first. Students first, yeah. And uh, uh, those that may not know about these programs, superintendent, that may be encouraged to join them and be a part of it. We're one of the biggest, we are probably very close to the biggest employer in the city, uh, in, in our region. And uh, we certainly, with a 600 and something million dollar budget every year, uh, don't keep it in the bank, we spend it. And again, I believe architects and 
contractors could be encouraged and others. I don't, whoever we buy our, our so, who's our soap and paper towel vendor? I mean, they could all be involved in contributing to this and making us a stronger district that they benefit from. Thank you, great report. Mrs. Alvey. Thank you, just a couple of questions. So you mentioned at the beginning that uh, this is really geared primarily, or I guess I should say first, to our underserved and our foster kids and so forth. So how is that priority uh, created? Do you have applications? Uh, and how, how, do you, how do you make sure that we are actually giving it to our underserved kids first? So we first look at the applications and the line staff that we have allocated. And if we have space to let everyone in, then we do so. And most of our school sites, that's what we've been able to do. Then at that point, what we do is we have a waiting list. We do look at, we run our reports that we do have at, that are confidential, but through the district. And we make those determinations and we go from there. And I will include that. I, I let the parents know um, through, this, through the site staff, like these are the students that will be let in. But we have not had that issue okay. currently. We do have wait lists, but at the schools that we have wait lists, they're, um, they have, they're, that's not the issue. I'll just. Okay, well, I'm gonna take yeah. your word for it, that you do check. Yes, we do. And that the kids that need it the most get it. Yes. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yes. Okay, and then the second question I have is, who monitors our after-school programs? Uh, do we expect that, say, at Earhart, the Earhart principal monitors it, or do we have someone who, can, who goes around to kind of uh, quality check it? So it's a partnership. Hmm. This year, um, the cabinet and board members, thank you. Um, we have expanded my department. So I do have managers, one that has just started in the last two weeks and one that we're currently waiting to start with us. And they will be, we will be placed in clusters and we help monitor. We do have also a district TOSA that helps and goes, but we work in partnership with the principals um, that are there be, and, and make sure, because the program is written that way. So when you go back to your Longfellow experience, mm -hmm. so you had someone checking hearts to make sure everything was cool, or then you had to sort of do that too? It was um, <laughs> for anything that happened on campus at the time, it was the responsibility of the site admin, which, which still is um, as far as if there's an incident with a student, I, I do get called, but I w work with the principal because the principal knows the family and the children first. And we follow the school rules. So each school, while we have our district rules, we do have some s variations within the school, right? We have school cultures. And so we follow that, we follow their PBIS plan so that the students aren't disconnected from the day. But um, it really is truly a partnership. But as we look at our systemness and because of the funding and because of the support that cabinet has given, we will be able to um, have more support to our site admin as that is something that um, is, is wanted and something that we can only all benefit for the more we do safety checks. I myself go out to schools. My TOSA goes out to schools. We look at everything. Okay. From gates to walking in to ev everything. Good. So someone's checking, I guess, then to see that, oh yeah, they're getting their art twice a week or they're getting their this or they're getting yes. their that. So it is monitored through, um, because ACES is a grant and we follow the most restrictive rules. Um, so we do follow their program plans. And so when we go, I, they have to um, submit those plans automatically. So something that we revamped this year is if something is missing, and, and it happens, we get busy. Um, I go ahead and I um, email the site administration so that they, if they need any supports, we can come out or if it's just a gentle reminder or whatever, just so that we're on the same page. And then we go out and take pictures and celebrate because we have an amazing staff. Our TOSAs are really top notch um, and it's been wonderful. And we have amazing administrators that take a lot of pride in their programs. I know you'll find Mr. Cash 
at his and um, Ms. De Robles helping out a lot at Fremont. Um, you have Donna Dorsey that knows exactly what's going on. I mean, I can name every single principal. I talked to three today on the drive here to the board meeting. So Good. they're amazing. Good. I'm just, I'm just double checking to make sure you guys are quality controlling it. So mm -hmm. sounds terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Elvey. Dr. Farouk. Thank you, President Lee. Uh, thank you, Ms. Castro, for that great presentation and all, all of your guys' work. Uh, my questions are somewhat related to what Trustee Alvey was saying. Uh, because, so my understanding is, is that uh, this is just TK through six, right? Actually, it is, you, you expand to TK through six, mm -hmm. but then if there are funds um, that are still there, you can extend to, you, you can continue to go. But and my, that's what we're doing. But my point is, is it's not like anybody who, outside of those grades, is, it's not available to just anybody. It's only based on if there's, this is what the program is actually focused on, is, the, is that age range in terms of? That's the priority. Yeah. But as we meet the um, obligations through the funding, we then can go ahead and service other grade levels and age levels. And but, that is our goal. But where, where are we at with actually realizing that? Uh, so um, December 31st, um, we will have every elementary school have, should have been opened. And then um, we are looking at making sure STEM Academy is open in January. And then in the fall, we're looking at opening Miller, who has not had a program. And we will use ELOP funds to do so because they are not an ACES funded site. Well, because to me, when we when we talk about you know mitigating learning loss and the, the these uh, broader challenges uh, that are our students are facing, these are exactly the kinds of efforts these extended learning programs mm -hmm. where it goes beyond the standard instruction. My point about this is that I think, irrespective of these grants and efforts, which is fantastic, and we're very fortunate that we have that, these are the kinds of things that the board should be getting opportunities to weigh in on general fund commitments and dedication because shoring these things up and really in a in a true uh, authentic manner making this accessible to every student that wants to do that i think that really should be the goal and knowing what the shortfall is and you know having those discussions but i know there's obviously trade-offs associated even with those conversations but to me as a, as a board member that's the kind of context that would be helpful thank you um and then uh, I wanted to understand also uh, that in terms of this this question about this family survey uh, about huh, I'm sorry what the, the earlier question about the, yeah, in the, the program question. metrics oh, in on slide okay. five uh, so in, in this you're saying that these uh, families are are basically subjectively reporting themselves my child is doing better academically. Am I understanding that correctly? It's a, yes, it's, it's, they give a scale if they agree, strongly agree, disagree. Are, are we doing anything that's, that's more objectively measurable, whether it's a test or any kind of assessment that um, can, can evaluate that in, in, in that kind of fashion? So we do disaggregate data. We, ha we have that capability with the students. We put them in a different system for attendance so that we can pull that. And we look at, we can look at their CAS for scores based on their attendance rate to the program. Hmm. The difficulty right now though is we just took a, a two year hiatus. So, and different students movement. So we did look at the movement within the program in the last few years. So that is something that we do we do have, and that is something that they have done in the past. I think it would be very helpful, and I understand that we weren't, we didn't have all the data mm -hmm. given the gap that you just mentioned. But as much as we can have that that data and context, I think that would be uh, very helpful just in moving forward and us being able to understand. Because again, I think, I think the 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 vision behind this, I think the the. the the intensity of partnerships and, and energy you have. I mean, this is, this is exactly the kind of thing that, you know, we, we want to be investing in. Uh, and so I just think just those additional things, this is not to detract from the, the, the value of what you're doing, which just help um, make sure that you're feeling fully supported. Thank you, Dr. Thank, Farouk. Thank you. 
Mr. Kinnear. Thanks. Uh, what do we have elementary schools that have waiting lists? I think I heard you say yes. Yes, we do. How many do we have? Uh, Currently, we have um, three, and it's a staffing issue. It's a staffing issue with mm -hmm. three. What are those three schools, just for my curiosity? Highgrove, Mountain View, and Washington. And Washington. Uh, do we have do we have students uh, on any waiting list at all? that are identified as needy students and disadvantaged students? Uh, yes. We do? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I have any questions. I echo uh, Dr. Farouk's comments uh, about uh, the value of the program and, and how optimistic we, uh, we are about seeing real uh, increases in achievement based on uh, uh, based on the design of the program, the, the great staffing that, uh, that, that you have, and uh, what we see happening in the future. So thank you. Thank you. And I just wanted to, just so I don't mislead, clarify, we have added staffing at those school sites, and it's and a couple of those school sites have more than they've ever had before. It's just such a need, so I just wanted to make sure that, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kinnear. A uh, couple questions. No, one, one last comment. No, it's, sometimes it's a good thing to have a waiting list because you're growing and, and that's you know, something that you have to address as, as you improve. So I, I didn't mean it to no, be no, no, thank a you, negative thank comment. You. Just, thank you. All right, a um, couple questions for me. On that program metrics, that one of those first slides uh, shows our attendance targets 85%, um, but we're meeting the target at 93.8%. So how did we come up with 85%? So that's an ACES target. So oh, for okay. our 20 sites that are ACES funded, we have a, a target number that we have to meet. Say and, what ACES is. I'm sorry. <laughs> the ACES um, grant is the after school safety, school safety um, grant that we've had at the original 20 sites that have funded the after school program. And so, so we utilize that target because we have to meet that. That is a so that's yeah. the that's the floor that the the grantor is is requiring us to to come in at. So we're exceeding that um, by that that number at least for now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then I think you answered my other question. I, you mentioned twenty elementary schools and six uh, middle schools are currently being served with these uh, ex expanded learning opportunities, but with the expansion to the existing sites by January, it sounds like every elementary school will be be served by this, correct? We, yes, we only have three more schools to open. Awesome, all right, good, that's, that's good news. Um, and then, um, what, is, is, is there anything that would prevent us from, because my concern too is with this learning loss and, and using this program to have small group intervention or assisting those students that, that are, are struggling at, at reaching, reaching those grade level standards. Uh, and all of these partners are, are great and I'm glad that we have them, um, but they're not certificated teachers um, with, with that kind of knowledge and that kind of an experience. So is there anything that would allow us, should there be teachers that want to participate and do kind of some kind of small group instruction uh, after school? Yes. Retired teachers, current teachers? Thank you for the question. I, I wanted to clarify that um, the intent of the Assembly Bill 130 that put forth this funding um, was really in response to parents' needs for longer term of care. Um, and so the primary purpose of it is not necessarily to close achievement gaps, but provide a safe place for students. Now, certainly we want to utilize and capitalize on this opportunities to meet students' social, emotional, and academic needs. Um, so in response to your question, yes, we do have the opportunity. Teachers are able to come in and teach after school intervention. We've negotiated a rate per the approval of the board, um, a higher rate for teachers to be able to teach those. And we are actively um, providing those opportunities. Those are specific interventions that are geared towards the needs that um, have been seen at that site that teachers have determined they need to go in and, and close. So it's an avenue that we have kids after school and then let's give them a little bit more. Um, but I wanted just to be clear that really this funding, while we are going to leverage it 
to help to close our achievement gaps, the intent of the funding, again, is that safe space for students. Cool. Good, good. I appreciate that context. Um, I'll just say again, I think it would be nice if they're already with us and we have them in a safe place, if we can get them caught up if there's additional funds and uh, not only offering those opportunities to teachers that are, are currently working for us, but maybe reaching out to retired teachers that are looking to, to continue to have an impact in the classes uh, or with our students. Um, and then two more questions from me. Uh, we're required to have 30 days, non-school days, uh, and I know um, a survey went out to poll parents and families about when they would likely come if we offered it. So I think that's good that we're asking parents. Uh, one thing I noticed that was not uh, on the survey was weekends. So are weekends um, something that's being considered, like Saturdays perhaps, for, for these 30 non-school days? We did not do that um, as, as an option based on our, sta our staffing because of the need of having the staff versus, I mean, if we put out an offering that we've already had conversations about, that would be difficult, but it is something that we're gonna continue to talk about with our line staff as we put in our plan for next year because we're already going to be in January starting our plans for next year as well. All right, I mean, it would be good to just poll parents and see if that's, you know, I imagine if we got to negotiate, non-staffing issues are gonna happen on spring break and Christmas break and Thanksgiving breaks. So I don't think it's a Saturday would be, be any other, other kind of an issue for staffing if we prepare our staff for that. Um, and then my last question has to do with uh, sixth grade science camp. I know that this has been a, a funding issue for school sites. Um, over the years, depending on, on resources and different school sites do different things. Is, is, is this pool of money something that could be used for supporting sixth grade science camp? At this time, the way that we um, organize sixth grade science camp, it is not eligible um, for this funding. If we were to re-envision how we did sixth grade science camp and perhaps offer it over spring break when it's a non-instructional day, then we could utilize this funding. Uh, at this time, though, that is not um, our, our plan, but we may consider that in the future. Okay, perfect, that's, that's it for me. And I don't see any further questions or comments from the board, so thank you both for, for the presentation this evening. All right, so item number two on our reports, this is a report on- If week. I may quickly interject, I'm sorry. Um, but as you all know, I'm in college application season right now, and I have to go home to finish essays. I know this is my last meeting, and uh, I'm sorry I'm leaving you guys, especially with the two exciting things like, uh, first of all, STEM and also the ELPAC. Um, but anyways, this is just a final goodbye. I'll see you guys around, but have a lovely day, guys. Thank right, you thank so you, much. Thank you, Good job, Abby. Bye-bye. All right, so our next report is a reclassification in the uh, Summative English Language Proficiency Assessment for California, or LPAC. Uh, Dr. Sosa, welcome back, uh, and thanks for bringing this item. Thank you, President Lee, Superintendent Hill, Cabinet Members Community. This evening, I have the pleasure of bringing our 2021-22 uh, English Language Proficiency Assessment for California, or what we call LPAC scores, and to discuss our reclassification process. With our focus on student learning, obviously we focus on supporting English language learners throughout the organization, is also directly supported within our LCAP and Actions 1.4C and 2.1F. So in tonight's presentation, I'll be focusing on four main uh, portions here. We'll be looking at the characteristics of an English language learner here in Riverside. We'll talk about the LPAC assessment itself to get a better understanding of exactly what it assesses. We'll look at the results and then we'll look at our reclassification criteria and data. And just to clarify, when I use the term reclassification, what I'm referring to is a specific process in which students who have a language other than English are taken through a language acquisition process and then meet a set criteria by the state of California to then be determined to be fully English proficient. And I'll go over that in just a couple of minutes, but I just wanted to clarify so that it wasn't a, a term we might stumble upon. 
So let's take a look at our English language learners here in Riverside Unified. Currently, we have just over 6,700 English language learners this year. You'll see that the vast majority of our students, actually two out of three, or about 64% of our students, are at the elementary grades. We have about seven, uh, excuse me, 23% in high school and about 13% within our middle school grades. Uh, just as a point of clarification, here in Riverside Unified, we have about 17% of our students that are classified as English language learners. When we look at our English learners in terms of student groups, which uh, student groups are students belong, we'll see that we have about 18% of our English language learners are students with disabilities, which is proportionate within 1% to how the, the percentage of English learners within the district. That's very important when we look at that because we're very conscious of what's called disproportionality. In other words, having a greater number of uh, a certain group of students than in the total population. And so we look at that very closely. When we look at where are our English learners born, you'll see that 80% of our English language learners are born right here within the United States. The next largest country is actually Guatemala, uh, with almost 10% of our English learners coming from Guatemala. When we look at our English learners' home language, we see that 88% of our English learners' home language is Spanish. Now let's take a look at the LPAC assessment itself. The LPAC assessment is a quite rigorous assessment. It actually comes in two parts what we call an initial LPAC and a summative LPAC. By California state law and federal law, for every student who enters school with a language other than English, we need to assess their language proficiency, and we do that with the initial LPAC. For us here in Riverside, as for in many districts within the state of California, the vast majority of those students are kinders. They're youngsters who first come into school who have a language other than English, and we assess their language proficiency. The initial LPAC is quite a short assessment. It takes between 30 and 45 minutes, and its uh, intention is to give teachers a target of the language proficiency a student has so that they can start their instruction right away to be able to meet the needs of students. And then as students progress through the year, whenever a student has been uh, designated an English learner, they must take the summative LPAC until they reclassify. So in other words, we test students annually of their language acquisition on the summative assessment. That summative assessment uh, looks at both oral language and written language. Again, it's looking at the whole pantheon of language development so that we can give teachers and our system really valuable information about how to meet the needs of students who are acquiring the language. When we look at our results from last spring, we see that just over 11.5% of our students earned a level four. So let me back up and pause just a moment. For our LPAC assessment, there are four levels of um, scoring levels or four levels of proficiency as designated by the state of California, levels one through four. Level four is what's deemed by the state as well-developed. We have about 34% of our students who are at level three, which is considered moderately developed by the state. 33% at level two, which is designated as somewhat developed. And then about 21% at level one, which is minimally developed. When we look at our scores over time, over the last three years, we can see that just this last spring, we actually saw an increase in the percentage and number of students earning a level three and four and a decrease in our students earning a level one. That's good news. That means our students are progressing up the system. Research tells hold on, us hold it on takes... One Sorry, Dr. Sosa. Dr. Fruk has a clarifying so, question. Sorry, just because it's in the context of these slides. When you're saying like these um, summative uh, assessments and you have level one and all that, are you saying that after they've gone through like a year or, or some whatever period of, of academic instruction to help them reclassify, then this is the outcome of it? Or are you saying that at any given time, some people are coming in and they're being assessed and they're coming in you know, fresh without having the instruction, some are further along. Is there a spectrum in this or is this uh, a, 
or is this a snapshot in one period of time? Yes to both. Okay. We have to test a student with the summative assessment at any point when they enter school. So for example, we can have a student who comes to us in April, we give the initial assessment, we have to give the summative assessment before they exit, which might be another three weeks later. We have students who come at the beginning of the year and they take the summative at the end. So it really does vary. I, I think throughout that's the very process. important context to put just in the, in the future um, as context of that. Thank you for explaining. Thank you for the question. So when we look at those scores over the last three years, this is what we um, see, as I was mentioning. I just want to make one quick point. We would typically look at more than three years of data. We would look at at least four to five years of data. But in this instance, we're not able to do that because in between the 2018-19 and the 2019-20 school year, the state changed the cut scores of the assessment. So those scores are no longer comparable. The cut scores changed, some of the questions on the items of the exam changed, so we can really only look at three years of data. We also need to take into account that during this time period was the COVID closures. Uh, that typically explains that dip in student proficiency in 2021, and now going into 21-22, last school year, we saw that we have an increase. When we disaggregate that data by grade span, this is the outcome we have. You can see that as our students progress through the grade levels, we typically have students who uh, have a high, higher percentage of levels three and four at seventh grade, and then it drops down in high school. That's because the vast majority of our students who are reclassified, they reclassify between the, uh, the time periods when they uh, leave elementary and when they leave middle school. That's why those numbers will vary for the next year. And I'll get to the reclassification criteria in just a second that will add a little additional context to why those level four scores vary as we go through the levels. We pay close attention to our student groups as well. So we have our disaggregated student group information. When we get into the LPAC itself, I won't spend a whole lot of time, but I just wanted to share that the assessment is quite rigorous. And in fact, the summative assessment here is assessing the standards of English language development of the state of California. So it is as rigorous for language development as the CASP assessment is rigorous for uh, English language arts and mathematics. You can see that as our students begin their young careers, they, they are stronger in oral language, which tends to be, as we develop, we use oral language more. As students go through the grade levels and as the demand, the higher cognitive demand and language demand comes, we see that students need more support in written language. And so this is something that we're focusing clearly on. I will point to some next steps here in just a moment that will highlight that. So our reclassification criteria, by the state of California, students who earn a level four make the initial qualification for reclassification. There are four levels. It used to be level three and four, and now it's level four only. So it takes that very thin band of students who earned a level four, and that's who's eligible. Then we must look at their academic proficiency. Students need to be on par with their English language speaking peers. We also have parent and teacher recommendations. Parents are part of this process to get their feedback to see if they believe their students are ready for that reclassification to uh, fluency. And over the last three years, you'll see that our reclassification rates have been increasing, which is a good sign. That five and a half percent is not where we want it to be. Our goal is to be at least 7% a year, but coming out of the pandemic, we are making progress toward a goal of reclassifying more students every year. So what are we doing about this? It really gets to the what's next. Just, just a little snapshot of some of the tools we have available to us in our monitoring tools, in our cycle of inquiry of which we've spoken about consistently with that target of improving language instruction and learning for our 
students. So we have six categories of ongoing support for our English learners. I'm going to highlight just two of them really briefly, progress monitoring and focus on language and standards. Maintaining an awareness of the needs of our English learners is very, very important. It's key to being able to provide those instructional supports and scaffolds within, within the regular instructional day. So we have two tools that we've brought on board over the last three years to help teachers uh, have a better gauge of where their students are. One of them is what we call the Lost Links Assessment. It is, for all intents and purposes, a district benchmark for language acquisition. We haven't had that before, and we've relied on our publisher tools. Now we have a tool that mirrors the LPAC that gives teachers high quality data over the whole pantheon of language instruction for their students. We give that assessment to our students twice a year. That information gets put into a data system that we've brought online in the last three years called Elevation. It was the name that's in the upper left. That elevation system has every one of our English language learners in it, and it has their LPAC scores, it has their lost link scores, it also has their attendance, and it has some other academic features so that our teachers can look at their English learner progress in real time and be able to monitor the progress of their English learners. With our focus on language and standards, the last time I was here, I shared that uh, reality that we all learn with language. The use of language is how we learn and acquire. It's extremely important that our English learners have increased opportunities for what we call language production in the classroom. In other words, we need English learners to speak more often in the classroom. So in order to help support our teachers to do that more effectively, we've committed ourselves in instructional services across all of our content areas to embed within our professional development a structure called collaborative conversations, which without boring you with the details, this is a research proven structure that will give students opportunities to rehearse, practice with peers, practice with their teachers, and have that modeled instruction done for them in a cohesive manner. That training is being uh, integrated into all of the professional development that we do within the Instructional Services Department. So whether it's specifically on uh, language arts or whether teachers come for a science training, they're going to get collaborative conversations infused into that because we know language is used throughout learning, not just in English class. And I will be happy to take any public comments or board comments. Thank you, Dr. Sosa. Mr. Kinnear, do you have any public comment? No public comment. All right, open up to the board for questions or comments. Start with Mr. Hunt. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Dr. Sosa. I just wanted to, going back to you involved the parent in deciding whether the young person should move to reclassification, just give me an idea, give us an idea what that looks like. How do you bring them in? And do you, do you I assume you're going to show them. Well, let me just add, let you answer instead of me assuming. Go ahead, sir. I think you were on the right track there, Mr. Hunt. We bring parents in. It is really like a parent-teacher conference. Mm -hmm. And so parents are brought in. Uh, we share data with them. We ask parents questions about how they're experiencing their students' progress. Uh, ask them if they have any concerns, any feedback, anything that's going on. The teacher uh, is part of that process as well as an administrator is part of that process. And so it is very much like, I think the best description would be like a parent-teacher conference and to get all voices in before the team decides that the student is ready for reclassification. Thank you, and, and do we, I know we have adult school, but it, is there programs out there whether we offer or others to advance those parents in English language uh, learning? I, I know several Hispanics, particularly Guatemalan families and that, uh, friends with my family and and uh, they don't have the time to, to go you know god bless them take adult school so i just like to hear more about that and thank you no certainly and uh, we'd be happy to provide that but just one little plug for the adult school i think actually the uh lang um, the english as a second language courses here is one of the top 
uh, set of supports uh, besides getting your high school diploma, and that's growing every year. And I also know that within the FRC, we do a lot of partnering, particularly with the Guatemalan consulate, in uh, reaching out to families and helping them to be able to right. learn English. I think we have like six, I think I heard you know, 600 and something people enrolled in, in that program you mentioned. Wonderful, thank you. Mr. Kinnear. The, uh, uh, the assessments themselves, who gives those? Are those individual assessments? If, you know, way back when, uh, individual students had to take that uh, assessment, very, very time consuming, uh, very staff intensive. Is that still the case? Uh, the, you're, you're asking about the Lost Links assessment, I think. Yeah. The Lost Links assessment is, uh, parts of it are one-to-one, -one, parts of it are group. But yes, it is a uh, time intensive assessment. Uh, we do have a process in which uh, teachers give it at some schools and then other schools in which they have a very large number. We support out of instructional services, um, testing teams, so to speak, that come and support uh, teachers with that. But because we have such a variance across our district, that model varies. Okay, thank you. You, you mentioned the, uh, the collaborative conversations. Uh, uh, can you can you discuss uh, program uh, support for writing? Uh, because you said written language was the most difficult area uh, for for kids to to master, and that certainly makes sense to us. Mm -hmm. um, what what do we have in place for uh, for writing? And so, in terms of writing, I think we and as a former English teacher myself, I used to find that writing is one of the most difficult things to teach. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of those kind of enigmatic things we think that, well, you just expose people to reading and they can write, but it in fact isn't like that. So we've got uh, tools and systems of uh, things. For example, Step Up to Writing is a program or a structure that some sites use. Other sites use a structure that might be called Six Traits of Writing. So it's a different process for that. Uh, but within making sure that our English language learners have access begins with vocabulary development. That's the very first piece it begins. And so there, there were other PD opportunities I could have shared, and some of them are on designated ELD, which speaks exactly to what you were asking. Uh, thank you. you know, I, I thought the report was a great report. I, I appreciate the data. I'm excited that, that the data shows uh, shows progress, and I know we want to have even more progress, and we will, uh, but it's, it was a, a, a thorough report. I also liked you reviewing the characteristics of our, of our English learners and spending some time talking about the, the, the reclassification tests themselves, because they're challenging. They're not, they're not, uh, it's not easy to, to move from one level, and it's not easy to reclassify. Uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in this system. I, I think our staff is good, doing a good job uh, with, uh, with, with this. And I also appreciate the fact that you mentioned what our next steps are and how we're trying to do a better job uh, with, uh, with our English learners. So thanks for a, a thorough report. Thank you, Mr. Kinnear. Dr. Farouk. Thank you, President Lee. Uh, and I wanted to piggyback off of some of the inquiries of my, co my colleagues. Uh, the first one was, you know, I think it might be helpful for us if, if we actually have like a testimonial from an English learner to, that's gone through the reclassification and just hear from their experiences because I know we've been get, gotten a lot of reports, you know, throughout the time that we've been on our respective tenures, but I feel like that D d direct message. I mean, again, we visit classrooms, and the th but I mean, in a more, in a this kind of a context, I think would be instructive in the future. Um, the, and to piggyback off of what uh, Trustee Hunt also was asking about the role of the parents, I appreciate your response regarding the linkages with the adult school. I think that's a very smart and you know a logical synergy there. My question, though, is is given the realities of. The, there's formal time commitments, you know, actual certificated programs are much more ambitious. Is there some middle ground that if I, if I don't have time to do, go through a formal pro program, but I know that me, that I have an interest and in me making progress at home 
to, uh, you know, uh, with English literacy will make my daughter or son at, uh, you know, when their time at home reinforce the things that they're learning at school. And it's, you know, and I want to do that anyway. Mm -hmm. Is there some gr gr more gray area where there's some kind of, even if it's very incremental progress, there's something positive that could be done with that? I think that's a great idea, and we definitely need to look into a third or a fourth option. Just give uh, folks opportunities. We'd be happy to look into some of those things. I, I like. I'll give you just a quick example that might be easy. Like these apps, like Duolingo, us maybe sponsoring some sub subscriptions for some of these uh, programs for for parents. Ways where people can do it at their own pace and and in their own situation, but. Uh, we making some kind of a, a gesture and, and you know support to meet them, um, and I'm not saying that specific app because maybe that won't be the appealing means. That's purely an example. Um, my next question is: uh, I know that it, 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 uh, about 12 percent of our English learners are not uh, native Spanish speakers, right? From your from your presentation. Yes. So my question is: is I'm assuming, and I, maybe I'm mistaken, but there's so much of an emphasis on preparing Spanish speakers to, you know, be biliterate and uh, and uh, have the fluency with English also. So, is there more of a specialty and uh, a system for for those students, or how effective are we with the non-Spanish English learners uh, in terms of our staffing and whatever? strategies that might be unique to different cultures and different languages outside of Spanish? I don't currently have that information at my fingertips, but that's something I can look into. Okay. Uh, and then my last question is regarding uh, our, our um, families from Guatemala. It's, um, your slide says it's 9.5 percent, uh, you know, the highest one besides people that are, are born here in the United States. And we know uh, that there's an in indigenous uh, population that that Spanish is not their um, their language, and that the partnerships with the consul uh, general that you just mentioned uh, has helped us with that. I'm just curious because we've had these discussions. How has that been going? Because it's been like a couple of years now. What traction have we seen on uh, on that? specifically to those indigenous populations from Guatemala? So our Guatemalan families speak a language called Canobal. Mm -hmm. um, I would have to defer to my colleague, Dr. Perez, in the Family Resource Center in terms of the district-wide, but I can tell you anecdotally from when I was in the Research and Assessment Office, mm -hmm. we really made an effort to translate more district-wide surveys, let's take, for example, into Canobal, so that our families would have access as well. From an instructional services perspective, we continue with that. But from a district perspective, I would have to defer. Yes. Part of the Family Resource Center, um, one of their equity goals is actually working closely with the um, Guatemalan families who speak on Obal. Um, what they've been doing since the school year has started has done a lot more active outreach with the community liaisons to make contact with the families. Many of the families. Um, uh, find some some kinship in in each other, so that's how the liaisons have been able to make more connections, as well as connecting them to some of the resources with family um, through the FRC, as well as kind of looping them into some of the resources they have here at the adult center, adult school, and um, learning Spanish and learning English. Okay, thank you, uh, all, both of you, for those responses. All right, thank you, Dr. Fruk. Um, so I have more than a few questions. So if you don't have answers, you can get back to me later. Um, so I was a little bit surprised to learn that eight out of 10 of our English learners are actually born right here in, in the United States. So I imagine that a majority of our English learners start with us in kindergarten. That's correct. Right, so um, do we know what the average number of years it takes for a RUSD student to reclassify? I don't have that at my fingertips, but I could get okay. that for you. All right, and then um, with 17% of our students uh, being English learners, it's a, big, it's a big population, like you said, it's kind of on par with, um, I mean, I think that's more percentage-wise than our students with disabilities. So Slightly. What, what kind of support staff do we have outside, you know, classroom teacher uh, to support those students? 
We have an English services department that includes a coordinator of K-12 English learners. Uh, we have uh, two TOSAs who also support our English learners in our DLI program. Okay, so is that three? Uh, it's district level, but we really are decentralized. So we have every school site has what we call an EL contact, which is um, kind of the district office arm support that goes down to the school sites. So that would be an additional 50 staff members that are supported by the district office uh, staff to do and support their activities on their site. So what, what does the EL contact do? It uh, would be the main point of contact for, uh, we have meetings once a month where we support them in terms of um, compliance issues, but also in terms of instruction. Uh, so so it's a certificated employee? or is It's this... a certificated employee, right, correct. So a teacher. It's a teacher. A teacher, okay. All right. So how does that support level compare to uh, other programs in the districts that would support similar group of students? I, I would have to reflect on that a little bit more, Mr. Lee, before I okay. give an answer to that. Yeah, I think what I'm getting at is I'm a, a little bit concerned that given the challenge of, of, of trying to reclassify English learners, especially now that uh, the standard to reclassify is, is level four, um, that we're going to need additional support to help reach the goals that, that we want to reach. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm... I'm hopeful that we're on the on the right track to 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 improve these numbers. I don't think anybody's happy with these numbers, and it's nobody's fault. I think about what we we went through through the pandemic, how hard it was for students that speak the language to stay stay on grade level standards. I can only imagine how difficult it was for English learners to participate in distance learning uh, and learn English, right? Either either verbal speaking the language or or writing the language. Uh, so I just want to make sure that um, we have enough support in place to support the teachers in the classroom to, to reach the goals that we expect uh, in terms of progress to get our students reclassified. Um, and then we talk about uh, long-term English learners, the 1,200 students or so. So what classifies a long-term English learner? That is a student who has been an English learner longer than seven years. Okay, yeah, that is a, that's a long time. Um, all right. So again, I think I'm, I'm just, I'd be interested to hear on, on it in terms of, and maybe even hearing from some teachers in addition to hearing some testimony from, from ELs, if, if the teachers who are actually teaching in the classroom, uh, the English learners, especially those that are teaching a higher proportion of students in their classroom that are English learners, if they feel that they have what they need to not only teach the students that are English learners, but also and simultaneously teach the students that are English learners. Um, my other question has to do with DLI. Um, and I realize that the, 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 the data that had came out is relatively new, so I don't know that our, our research and assessment team has had a chance to analyze it yet. But we have, a, have we had an opportunity to look at our English learners in the DLI program versus our English learners in the non-DLI program and see how they've done uh, on, on these tests? Uh, yes, and I think we've provided that information to the board in a board mail out. Can you share what those results are? I don't have them at my fingertips, but I'd be happy to share Was them. Was there you. a big difference in terms of reclassification rates of English learners in the DLI program? In For reclassification rates in itself, there was a dip with one year. Um, but last year, we had students who were uh, DLI English learners did reclassify at a slightly higher rate than students who were not DLI. All right, so I think I'm just trying to, as we move forward and, you know, you share some of these next steps, which I'm also hopeful about, um, I mean, I think it's going to take, I don't want to say complete rethinking, because this is, this is your all's field, but even though I know we've only taken this, this test the last three years, we had similar issues reclassifying students with the previous test. So I think it's going to take some real big changes in how we deliver education to our English learners and support English learners if we want to see big changes on the reclassification rate. Um, so that's why I bring up DLI. If that seems to be working, how do we apply those same principles that are working in DLI, like simultaneously teaching students in two languages, to, to the, to the non-DLI kids, right? So uh, I'd be interested to hear, uh, hear back on that. Um, and then on the, uh, some of the next steps, I was gonna ask a few questions. Um, 
So on the ongoing support, you highlighted some of those, but could you share a little bit more on uh, focusing on language and standards? How, how are we going to how are we going to accomplish focusing on language and standards? Give me with just a moment to get to that piece. One piece of that, as I had mentioned, was the collaborative conversations. In other words, helping teachers to have additional strategies to use with students to give them language, increased language opportunities. Another large part of that is re-clarifying and supporting teachers with designated English language development. That is probably the number one support that can help English learners acquire language, is consistent, cohesive language development in the classroom. Then supported by integrated ELD, which is um, a little bit different. I don't want to get into too much minutia, but designated ELD is the teaching of the language itself. Whereas integrated ELD is the teaching of students to use that language in content areas, how we use it. We do it kind of naturally as an English speaker. We, we learn that, but that is a, a two distinct skill sets that English learners need. And so we are continuing to uh, and redoubling our efforts to support teachers with that as we're coming back out of the pandemic to help get them back into that process of delivering English language development consistently to their students every day as required by education code. And then to do uh, integrated ELD as often as they need to to help their students uh, get that content language. Um. All right, and we, and we can continue this conversation more moving forward, but I, I, I will say that I, I, I'm concerned um, about the progress that we're making with English learners. I know this is not a, a problem that's only related to Riverside Unified. I was looking at the data from surrounding districts, and it seems like this is a struggle uh, across the state of California. Um, but doesn't, I mean, I think we've got some of the best people in the state working for us. So, so I, I'm worried that some of the solutions that you that you offered are a long-term solution, providing additional support, professional development to our teachers. It's not going to fix the problem t tomorrow or next year or the year after. I think it's going to take some time. So I think while we are building the capacity of our staff to be able to support uh, English learners, um, I think we got to do something else too. Um, and I know Mr. M Mr. Kinnear mentioned his, you know, you brought up collaborative conversations, but on, on the written part, I think students are, are going to need some additional supports, obviously, on that, because that's where we're struggling the most. Um, and then also on this content versus language acquisition. Um, if students are having a hard time with the language, they're not going to get the content that's being delivered in the classroom. Right. So having some kind of support in place, uh, in the classroom. So those students that don't understand the language, I mean, if they don't understand the language, they're not going to get the content. So how, how do we make sure those students get the content um, while, while they work on acquiring the language? So those are my concerns. Um, and I'm not sure on this ongoing support how they're directly addressed, um, like with specific examples. Um, so uh, I guess I'll just leave it at that. And uh, you know, we can continue, continue the conversation later. But I, I am encouraged by some of the things that are in place. I just think this is a, a big opportunity for us to make some big progress in uh, hopefully a relatively short amount of time, um, especially hopefully considering the additional support dollars we have right now uh, at different sites. Mr. Hunt. Thank you, President Lee, for those very thoughtful and insightful comments. I agree with you. Um, I'm gonna assume for a moment that State Superintendent Tony Thurman was correct in saying there's going to be 7.9 billion uh, allotted to schools on a continuing basis. Ms. Pyro will help us understand that better, but uh, along with the superintendent. But if it is, I do recommend that we apply where we can more of a turbo charge, for lack of a better education term, uh, to this area, particularly to our, the, the Guatemalans of, of indigenous uh, I never forget going to that King High School graduation when that young man had made it all the way through and how inspiring that was. But, and Dr. Farouk, uh, to give him credit, was the one in his first term that got us before the uh, Guatemalan consulate and, and that began a relationship. But I really would like to find out in the future, Ms. Power, what, doc, what Secretary Thurman was 
uh, what Superintendent Thurman was referring to. You don't have to do it right now, but if it is, I'm going to be, and I believe my colleagues to my right will, will uh, be interested too, that we target money there. This is, we've got to give these young people an opportunity to be successful uh, operatives here in, in America, and uh, uh, I just, it, it couldn't be more important. I mean, it, to me, it's like the foster youth. Jaime Escalante, and I won't quote him right, I'm sure, but said to the effect, if you raise the hurdle and you give them good coaching, they will clear it. And I think the state has raised the hurdle, and now we need to make sure that we're adding the coaching and the tools and the, uh, everything they need to do so. They're, they're our neighbors. So anyhow, that's just my point. Thank you, Mr. Lee, for those comments. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Mrs. Delvey? Thank you. Um, so what I think is happening is we are teaching our teachers strategies, which we hope that they will use successfully in classrooms while they're teaching all the kids. And we are hoping that these strategies, that where they use them, will have effect and that these kids will pick up their language skills in this context. And I remember uh, Mr. Lee and I, uh, this was w quite a while back before COVID, we went over to Moreno Valley, remember, and we were looking at specialized programs that they were using over at Moreno Valley Unified, which we thought had some merit. And they didn't get off the ground at that time for a variety of reasons. But they were kind of more pullout programs where they got the kids together to to really do some intense programs. Now, we don't do that. We don't pull kids out. I, I know we have a newcomers later on in high school, but when they're in TK6, we don't ever pull them out to give them intensive language? No, because actually doing that might seem like it's beneficial, but what happens when a student is pulled out of the classroom is they miss instruction that happened when they're there. And so then when they get I, back... I get that if, if they can understand the instruction that they're missing. I'm just worried that maybe they're sitting there in a fog and so forth, and I don't know. I, I just remember um, one young man who, uh, whose family came from China who told me that he didn't really understand what was going on until third grade. So I, I assume he... I mean, he was in school that whole time, but things weren't gelling until he got enough language skills to where they made sense. So I'm just wondering, um, we have no way of knowing if teachers are able to use these skills successfully, except for this test, right? This, this is our one test that we can judge that by. It's not the only thing we would judge it by. We, we judge it by walkthroughs in the classrooms and, and feedback provided. We do it in a school site setting with our collaboration time by talking with it and making, a, making that a priority okay. um, within there. So it's not just a test. It's, I think, more important. Okay, well, I'm just kind of echoing a little bit of, of Mr. Lee's thoughts, because uh, he's been bringing this up every year for the last, how many years? <laughs> Nine. <laughs> um, that, that we're not making enough strides in this area. And I, I if different programs don't work, then... Try something uh, else. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ms. Alvey. Thank you, Dr. Sosa. Thank you. All right, so we'll move on to the last report of the evening, um, which is a update on the district-wide STEM plan. I'm back. You're back. It says Superintendent Perez, but you're Dr. Sosa, so go for it. We're actually going to be sharing this, so Perfect. thank you. Uh, good evening, Dr. Perez and I. Will, we have the pleasure of reporting to you in the community on our district-wide STEM plan. The purpose of the presentation is to provide the board with a report on uh, the board's desire for a district-wide STEM plan. We'll be going over those portions, the goals, expectations, resources, teacher's perspective, which we have a video of a teacher, and then we'll be looking forward. Oops. This is not... There we go. Sorry about that. 
the variety of learning experiences and entry points that's been designed into our STEM plan is focused on both student engagement and achievement. Students succeed in our schools if the connections between what they're learning and their future is made clear. Furthermore, all students must have consistent and readily available access to STEM opportunities through career-connected, project-based, technology-integrated approaches to that work. The district-wide STEM plan is focused on helping students become socially engaged innovators and problem solvers for the future. <coughs> the plan is organized into four pillars of student learning, professional learning, organizational structure, and community engagement and is organized into goals, strategies, and uh, indicators. Students in RUSD experience STEM learning through multiple entry points that we have categorized as core, supplemental, expanded, extended, and specialty. We'll be sharing a wide variety of examples here on our STEM learning as students get those opportunities throughout. So we'll start off with goal one of our STEM plan, which is to have STEM-centered thinking to empower students and inspire students. Some of the ways that we do this is, oops, excuse me, is directly through our core program, which addresses strategies one through three. We have our core program, in other words, our science program, our engineering programs through science and our mathematics programs that are within the instructional day. What all students have access to is called the core. That happens at elementary, middle, and high, focuses on grade level standards. We have district assessments to monitor our progress and when students need on the spot support or intervention, that's provided to them as well. We also have supplemental experiences, which addresses strategy four of goal one. Some examples of supplementary experiences would be uh, STEM at the elementary level with our STEM kits. We have over 5,000 students and almost 200 teachers that are modeling lessons with the kits that have been provided to them. We have STEAM camps. We also have our career exploration that occurs K through 12 within our career technical education program. And we have coding that occurs throughout the grade levels and the grade spans. With our extended learning experiences, again, that also hits strategy four. Uh, this is just an example, and those are actually our students who experienced uh, some extended learning opportunities in the summer. We had both in-person and virtual opportunities, and that is what we called STEM Lab. STEM Lab is an opportunity for students to participate in science technology uh, education partnership with the city of Riverside at their summer learning labs. The STEM-focused learning labs showcased how STEM is utilized in all different kinds of career paths from public utilities, advanced manufacturing, law enforcement, and public safety. So it's bringing that real life STEM application to our students. We also have expanded experiences that, are, that also address strategy four with different clubs different types of opportunities like Inspire Her Mind, which is something we've had for a number of years. Uh, Ms. Castro talked about the Amazon Future Engineers Connection that'll be happening with our uh, extended learning program. Um, we also have connections with Google and uh, Lego Education throughout our organization. Next, we'll move on to goal two. With our goal two, this is expanding um, innovative STEM roots. In other words, really um, giving those opportunities as students move up through the grade levels with a more focused um, and intensive STEM experience that occurs within, and we have supports to do that. That occurs in our elementary with our grade level leads and our STEM mentors that we have at elementary with our technology mentors as well that help to uh, coach teachers and help students model lessons and instructional strategies, utilizing a more rigorous uh, set of expectations, what we call depth of knowledge, levels two and above. 
For our middle and high schools, we have support for students with our course leads, department chairs, and also with tech mentors at the secondary level as well. And for the remainder, I'm gonna pass it off to Dr. Perez. Good evening, President Lee and board and superintendent Hill. Um, in talking through goal three, it is a focus on innovative STEM educators. And this really is on highlighting our professional development, communities of practice, as well as leadership. With professional learning, I wanted to highlight just a couple of things. Um, one is some of the training that the team has uh, provided um, this last summer um, for 40 elementary teachers, and that's the, the picture that you see there. Um, this was in partnership with Cal Baptist University College of Engineering, and the training was around STEM-based, uh, project-based STEM. This summer, and looking beyond into next summer, um, we will be expanding that with offering two summer institutes, one for elementary and one for secondary. Pardon me. With goal four, um, a key piece um, of the work and especially a key piece of the, um, from the team, the innovation and learner engagement team, is our network of community engagement. Um, not only are we partnering with local partners, um, but we're also highlighting some of the local assets and really fostering the ecosystem or all of those connections um, to offer STEM to students and have those collaborations in the community and with families. As you can see here, um, the team has curated many, many partners across the state, nationally, and locally. Um, the district remains at the forefront of being innovative and um, regularly recognized for our partnerships. Another um, key piece, and you'll have some resources um, there for you, and we have a few for the public as well, is the Family STEM resource site. Um, this is another way that we exemplify goal four through that ecosystem and making these resources available to our families. Um, you'll see the bit.ly there as well as the QR code. And this is updated regularly with many resources that families can um, explore with their children to determine if there's pathways um, from elementary on that are of interest and can really maximize their interest. So two key pieces which the team is very excited to have back in person are STEM night and code night. Um, the team has been offering these district-wide and now schools are requesting to have these um, school-based as well. Um, so they are definitely in high demand. And we, the team just received a Google grant for $25,000 to expand code night offerings at middle schools. So momentarily, okay, we're gonna watch a video about family STEM. This was at Earhart. We are hosting our first Family STEM Night at Earhart Middle School. We are super excited to get our families doing our Lego challenge using the engineering design process. The Lego challenge is a fun whole family activity where you're asked to design the tallest tower that can withstand a simulated earthquake with our shake table. It teaches them, it gets them out of their comfort zone to try new things. Um, technology is definitely advancing, so I feel like they need that. So the first one did fall, but the second one didn't. Trying to figure out what we did wrong the first time because it fell over, um, and then going back and fixing it. And trying to work together to make it better. It teaches them how to work with you as a parent, communicate, and also it teaches them how to um, take initiative to do things on their own. The best part of our experience tonight was just how fun it was. It's not often that we just get to have a chance to sit together and build Legos and play with things and test and experiment different structures. I think the best part was just getting to spend time with my son. We have got other kids at home, so <laughs> yeah. 
All my fun night was playing with Legos, building a house. It's a fun event to both learn about STEM, put into practice some practical application stuff, and uh, just have a good family time together. So there you have a little snapshot of what that looks like at our STEM nights. And um, the team just recently hosted one at uni that was jam-packed and very similar. So goal five is focused on the pathways um, across the system. And that again is focused on industry partnerships and our, the work that the team does in CTE as well as developing student um, CTE ambassadors for the program. Uh, some of the highlights of specialty experiences that would touch on those three um, are Project Lead the Way. Um, we've seen that before here at the board. We have almost um, 1,900 students participating in seven schools through Project Lead the Way, the Biomedical Sciences Program at Arlington, um, as well as the Air Quality Program <clears throat> in partnership that our North High School students are participating in. Um, one of the documents that you see um, there on the dais as well as for the public is the STEM Career Guide. Uh, the team finalized this just recently and developed a resource so it highlights different STEM careers and the classes that students can take. Um, not only does it include the information about all of the courses in CTE and the pathways, but it also walks them through of possible careers that um, students can consider. Um, so what the nice piece about this also, it has those um, career conversation starters that would really help parents engage in that conversation with their children to see if this is definitely something they could be interested in. So it brings it very, very close to home. Um, our last goal, goal six, is that committed and consistent STEM funding, um, and which includes staffing allocation, making sure we have the um, required funds to be able to provide these um, resources to students. So because STEM incorporates both core and these other experiences for students, it is not just one sole source of funding. So, Core is funded through BASE, but we also have um, LCAP Action 2.1D, which utilizes supplemental concentration, um, as well as additional grants. So just wanted to highlight um, what we're doing um, with our LCAP funds. And given that we are still early in the school year in terms of um, expanding our allocation, um, the team is looking at um, piloting the um, elementary STEM kits at six different, at five different elementary schools and really honing in in a small cycle of increase. So it's really that pilot, see if it works in these small spaces to determine if we can scale out. Um, so the team is looking at doing that this year um, as well as boosting some of the other um, areas, that the student experiences that you just saw. So as again, through LCAP, through both the supplemental and concentration dollars and the ELO, uh, we bundle that with our action leads who through the LCAP process are um, gathering data through the, um, throughout the year. Our LCAP director does meet with them on a very regular basis. So they're not only tracking their dollars, but they're also um, looking at the data and what they're collecting and how they're using those expenditures. Um, we're also going to um, <clears throat> provide some perspective from a STEM lead. So we are just momentarily going to play a video of a uh, one of our STEM leads at uh, Hawthorne Elementary. Um, who, let me go back to my note. Um, who is a STEM lead? So we have 30 STEM leads, one at each of the elementary schools, and they get additional training. Um, in STEM and are able to bring that back to the school site. So when the team is, they can work directly with those STEM leads to be able to do uh, model lessons and work through them. So being able to cascade information broadly to the elementary schools. Uh, 
So for example, when the Aeli Tosas are modeling lessons in the classroom, well, they'll go out and actually do the lessons. 100% um, of the teachers have reported that there's evidence of student learning, opportunities for critical thinking and problem solving, as well as creativity. A first grade teacher um, reported that her students said that it was fun to build the mechanisms and then hard to try and prove them, but excited when they were successful. So they're really walking through that cycle to get them engaged um, into the opportunities. So we're gonna see a video um, from Judith Esquivel talking about her experiences with the STEM kits and what that looks like for students. Um, she's been an educator for over 20 years and currently teaches third grade. So if the team can put on the video. Good evening, President May and members of the board. My name is Judith Esquivel and I am a third grade teacher and the STEM lead at Hawthorne Elementary. I am here today to share with you how our students and teachers have benefited from the STEM opportunities at our sites. Every site, including Hawthorne Elementary, has received STEM kits and lesson plans to accompany them. These kits include coding tools such as Ozobots, Spheros, and Microbits. Students of all ages can learn to block code and work their way to coding with JavaScript. Students may also engage in the engineering process with LEGO Steam Park, Brick Q, Motion, Prime, and Essential kits. These class sets allow students to collaborate with peers and learn about force and motion through the process of planning, building, and creativity. Having these SIM kits available at our sites allows teachers the opportunity to provide quality and engaging lessons and instruction to our students. There are numerous opportunities available to instruct them, targeting all aspects of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. The availability of these materials allows teachers and students in TK through six equitable access and engaging lessons that spark curiosity, creativity, and collaborative discussions. Most importantly, we have the lessons to accompany the resources, saving us time, funds, and preparation for engaging lessons. The impact these hands-on STEM experiences have on our students is empowering. All students feel successful when participating in a STEM experience. They engage and collaborate with their peers using the appropriate tools and language. The level of engagement is evident across the grade levels. Students enter the room excited to learn and leave the room feeling confident and successful. So this is going to be pushing how it rotates one way and then we're going to be pulling for it to go the opposite way. So I had a little snapshot from a teacher. So looking ahead, um, as you'll notice, we don't have um, very concrete things, and that is um, a couple of, for a couple of reasons. Um, the team is wanting to pilot and look at very small cycles to see if we can scale out. Um, given that we are in October, um, we're exploring how do we then um, provide more hands-on experience for students and the venue to do that. So some of the areas we're talking about, do we want to explore sixth grade camp for all with opt-outs um, and utilize resources that way to give students experiences. Um, do we want to expand coding experiences and how are we going to do that? Um, and again, it's, it's really looking at each of the programs through the, the leads um, to address kind of the, the global demand and future of STEM. So um, in closing, I do wanna thank the entire team um, keep in mind, this is a collection of many different hands that work in core um, through our different departments, many of our staff who are here who work very, very hard to support teachers in the classroom and deliver uh, many, many lessons. So um, in closing, we are in process of really exploring some best practices um, that we can expand out. So this concludes the presentation and I look forward to, we both look forward to your um, comments and questions after public input. Thank you, Dr. Perez. Uh, one member of the public wishes to address this item, Duffy Atkinson. You have three minutes, sir. Thank you, President uh, Lee, Superintendent Hill, and board members. Uh, anytime you get Legos, you're, uh, you're winning, so. <laughs> the reason for traditional STEM programs, the reason that they're successful has been four factors, in my opinion. Number one is the academic rigor applied within the program. 
Number two is the pace of the curriculum, um, also known as the sequencing or the velocity of the teaching. Third is the level of the expectations that are brought to school every day by the students as well as the teachers. And finally, is that the, the STEM program has a 100% commitment. That's a full buy-in from all teachers, all staff, um, and the students. Everybody on, on these campuses are in it 100% for, for STEM. So I am, in principle, excited to hear about the fact that we are now looking at STEM spreading across the entire district. I think that's phenomenal. I think everyone should have the opportunity. It's been sort of the unspoken problem is that we have STEM just embedded in a single uh, building on, on our, uh, you know, in our district. So knowing that this is, is in process and we're working to try to find solutions for this is great, love it. Um, however, as a parent, I had kind of have some questions just to think about maybe we can get some answers to. So in a cross district implementation, um, would this act almost like an elective within the existing framework of sciences and math and everything else that, that our students are, are having on campus as we, as we have, have now? And then just, just it applying as a deeper dive on those topics? Um, and also, uh, the academy model works because there's a total buy-in from all admin teachers and staff. So how would this look if we don't get that on all of these sites? Um, do you have the full support of the RCTA uh, to do this uh, across the entire spectrum of, of the district? And finally, another uh, my last question really is, um, how does this look? Um, and how does it work and coexist with our existing STEM Academy as we have it structured now? Do they, co do they co coexist um, here? Uh, do, and if so, how does the differentiation of our existing STEM Academy uh, uh, continue on um, in the face of STEM working its way out through the rest of the district? Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'll open up to the board for any questions or comments of staff. Dr. Miss um, Alvey and then Dr. Verug. Okie doke. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit and maybe this helps with Mr. Atkinson's questions too. Um, the specialty programs that you're offering, the family nights and the code nights, sound terrific. How is this implemented? Is it equal across the district? Uh, in other words, do we give uh, sites money and say, here, you're going to have a code night and a family night? Or is this up to each individual school site? Currently, we've been offering them district-wide. So the team has been trying to select schools at various parts of the district but because we're seeing more demand um, and we got extra monies to also um, explore at the middle schools um, we can we are looking at how can we use the funds to for schools to be able to support their own stem nights great that would be terrific of course that's the goal if not we should at least make sure we're doing it in every cluster uh, you know, so yes. that it's there's some e equality. Second of all, um, I know that for a lot of kids, the, the key to getting excited and engaged about STEM is a field trip. I remember seeing an interview with Neil deGrasse Tyson, who was inspired by a field trip to a planetarium and, of course, became so enamored about it. So tell me about field trips and, and what are our funding for those kinds of things and how do those work into the system? We're so grateful to be able to have field trips back again coming, yeah. out, of, coming out of the pandemic. That was a huge loss of an educational opportunity. But now that we have that back, uh, schools typically fund field trips out of their site um, discretionary funds or they can also use their LCAP monies that are um, supported with them for um, those extended experiences. Uh, 
then in terms of how a school would choose that, that would be at the teacher's or the site's discretion as they work collaboratively <laughs> with giving their students experiences. Okay, and that's, that's where it falls apart, right? <laughs> because um, with lack of time or maybe not a coordinator or maybe not an interested party, then you don't, some schools that have a lot of really committed people get those field trips and some schools don't. So that's something that I'd like, I, I think um, can be organized a little better from the district level, like providing these kinds of field trips, uh, you know, offering them, organizing them and saying, here, here they are, instead of having them created sort of individually from each school site. I think, I think we could play a bigger part in making that happen. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Alvey. Dr. Farouk. Thank you, President Lee. <clears throat> uh, I appreciate uh, Trustee Alvey's comments, and I'll uh, allude to that. But uh, I'm assuming that someone from staff will follow up with Mr. Atkinson regarding his questions uh, you know, offline, I'm assuming. Someone will follow up. Okay. Uh, one thing I do want to mention, though, from his comments was that I think it really, we need to do a better job of communication regarding this whole question about the STEM school, because every school district has STEM programs for all students. Like, that's not something that is ever something that's becoming an awareness now or that this is related to that. Core instruction of STEM has always been continuously being provided for our students. What you're referring to when you talk about district-wide STEM plan and these efforts is very, uh, you're talking about very specific programs and uh, project-based learning. Like you're talking about things that are supplemental in nature, essentially, uh, to the existing foundation of, of STEM education that all students are getting um, and have been getting um, throughout the district. And that th when we talk about the STEM school, you're talking about really an advanced and high level of rigor where your people are wanting to immerse themselves as a path uh, in, a, in a very deep manner beyond what the uh, public school uh, level standards would normally require. That, that's the, the distinct, dis, distinction, is that correct? Uh, yes, more of a specialty I, experience for those students or families that want their right. child to have a specialty experience. Right. Because not, not everybody has the, the inclination to want to completely go down that path as like... Correct. The, so but I think um, there's enough... Uh, this is not uh, a, a one-off thing. I think there's, there should be some basic information to kind of explain, I think, that. Because I think it, it would serve to address that, that confusion. Um, but a, a few qu questions. Um, one, I saw that in these partnerships that you... you You've gone beyond the Inland Empire, and you even had UCLA on there, uh, which I, uh, is is great. I'm curious, what's the nature of that partnership with UCLA? Dr. Kong will explain that partnership. Good evening, uh, Superintendent Hill, Board President Lee. Uh, board members. Uh, par our partnership with UCLA is really the collaboration that we've done in leading computer science efforts across the state. So UCLA receives an NSF grant and has a coalition called uh, Scale CA, which is uh, their attempt to scaling computer science across not just Southern California, but all of California. So they've partnered with a few districts, um, Los Angeles Unified being one and Riverside being the other. So really? that is kind of the partnership that we have with UCLA. And uh, we've actually been invited by UCLA to co-present with LA Unified as the other partner district um, for one of the largest uh, computer science um, publications and uh, conferences that they'll be holding. And, and how did that come about? That's fantastic. That was just in part with um, the computer science efforts that we're leading in the region. Uh, the very last slide that Dr. Perez showed, it actually had a photo of one of our students when we first started with our first after-school coding pl uh, program, which was through Google called CS First. And from there, we were able to just kind of spread word of mouth of all the work that we've been doing. Um, we're involved in the national organization, Computer Science for All, which uh, a couple of us just returned back from. So just across the state, um, we are seen kind of being at the forefront of leading computer science efforts. So th that's fantastic uh, and really good to hear. The Inland Code Consortium, how many districts are we up to now? 
overall? So the consortium shifted to a model where the county is taking the lead in the sense, mm -hmm. uh, just because of some funding restrictions that came up with our partnership with code.org, but we are still the lead um, providers of professional development for all of the facilitators in the region. And you were really the lead of just establishing the consortium to begin with, right? Our, uh, on behalf of our USD? Uh, the team. The team, yes, yeah. Yes. Uh, th that's very gracious of you. Uh, so uh, uh, one comment I would make also, in, uh, given that you're finding real tangible value of branching out in broader, broader Southern California is, I highly recommend that we try to have more intentional engagement with Caltech specifically. I mean, there's a lot of great schools, uh, uh, you know, USC being one of them. <laughs> but uh, Caltech obviously is, is, you know, the premier, uh, 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 out, uh, at least on the West Coast, uh, for, for this kind of space. And I know that Professor Mabasher from UCR mm -hmm. has, with Jet Propulsion Laboratory and NASA and, and connected. But I, I hope there's more we can do with that and tying this in, I, I think that's a huge opportunity. Um, and if there's any areas that externally that it would be helpful for you to assist facilitate that, just you know, let us know. Um, the, I guess one general question I have is, when I saw these strategies, uh, let me see, um, going up to kind of the beginning, like goal one, uh, I'm trying to understand, it. it, it or when it says, like, what is the time frame of these things? When it says promote or increase or do this, like, what are you saying? This is like an annual time frame that you're wanting to do from year to year, or what? What's the frame of reference? Because the plan or the bulk of the plan really does emphasize our core program, mm -hmm. because that is the program that every student has access to, it's uh, written in essentially a three-year cycle. Okay. So as Dr. Perez and Dr. Sosa mentioned, we are consistently going back, looking at what's working and looking at that data to make shifts as we need to. And I apologize if I've missed this, but is there a sub-document to this where there's more specifics, like when it says strategy two on slide five, increase time on science in elementary schools, like what specifically do we mean by that? Are we, like what, you know, are we talking about five minutes? Are we talking, like what are we talking, like is that specified at all anywhere? Yeah, so some of that information will be in our larger document and we can get, get that to you. Okay, and then uh, I wanted to reference uh, the, that slide regarding funding. So given that that STEM is, uh, is you know, part of core instruction and, and embedded throughout the, the district and everything. I know that this slide is a little misleading because you, you have base in there and that's what you're really talking about. That's the, and that's, it's hard to measure exactly that because it's literally embedded in all the curriculum and, and, and instruction that we're doing throughout the district. But to me, even if that's the case, because obviously, again, this slide is misleading because the real dollar value, if you actually define what base is, is very substantial, right? But irrespective of that, I just think if we're talking about supplementary, we're talking about the things that this plan and this presentation is, the amount of money that's being referenced is just like, it just seems shockingly low, right? I mean, $1.5 million for the whole district. And it's amazing what you're able to do with it. I mean, really, that's your, and it's obviously it's a testament to like these industry partnerships providing these things in kind and so forth. But Again, I really hope that, and I'm sure this is a process and that you guys, you know, that's why that part hasn't been fully formed, but I, I really think these are the kinds of things where we really need to look at much more significant investments. Uh, and because again, when you when we look at the, the broader assessments, math being one of the key deficiencies in areas of, of growth, and th these are the, exactly the kinds of things that not only will advance our, our math and, and those broader, but it'll actually uh, create more enthusiasm. Because that's really the key is if you're, if, they're, if, the, if the students, the beauty of, the, of these supplemental things is that really focuses more on that, in, that engagement factor. Um, so I just wanted to, I hope you, again, you're going in that direction, but I hope that we can get that in the context. And then lastly, I just wanted to say um, kudos on two things that I, um, one that I know you, you guys have been doing really well for a number of years on tying in families. The, the, and you did an amazing job with coding. Our district was honored by the White House a, a, a multiple times on that. Um, 
It's really, really impressive. Because I think the other thing that I hope that we can do with this is that when, uh, when parents see uh, coding and, and, and uh, computer science opportunities in a, in a uh, uh, gaming kind of environment where it's, it's, it seems accessible and they can play with their elementary school kids, that it inspires them that they might be able to pursue uh, career, you know, uh, certificate-based career pathways themselves. And our relationship with our workforce centers could hopefully, I think that there's potential there. And I really hope that um, on this career reference you did on slide 21, uh, that again, we know that like in general, one of the challenges when you're looking from a career standpoint is for elementary school kids, you're trying to prepare them for jobs and careers that literally don't exist right now, right? Because of the, the longitudinal and how much the, uh, the, uh, markets and the economy is shifting. But the beauty with STEM is these types of skill sets are the most enduring and, and, and applicable and they're high quality jobs. So I really hope that like we're leaning he more heavily on this career side because I think it's going to, on the back end, create more enthusiasm, you know, for, for the, and when people see the context that this is, there's some relevance to this. Um, but again, I hope, I know that we do, with our CTE pathways, we do these things, but with the broader district-wide efforts, I don't know like, if we're fully capturing the, the, the potential of what we could be doing on promoting the career side. So th thank you, though. You, you guys, honestly, that, it, it, you guys, this is one of the, I think, the, the greatest sources of pride of the innovations of programming you guys are doing on this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Mr. Hunt. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll limit some of my questions and comments. First of all, wonderful. This is the beginning, and I'm looking forward to every year. Uh, Dr. Perez, you mentioned, uh, and thank you for all what you've done in your team, you mentioned there will be two summer sites, I believe it was. Where are these be located? The summer professional development uh, with CBU. Uh, no, I, I thought it was, uh, I, I misunderstood you. I, th I thought the two sites were for children students but it's it's for it's for professional development there's professional development and also um the the team is looking to pilot this school year uh with the elementary um stem kids okay yeah and just uh, to defer um and how are you developing effective community outreach you talk about that quite a bit what what are we how are we letting parents know about this and engaging their children and et cetera? It's through those family, um, those STEM and code family nights mm -hmm. and expanding those because that does give parents kind of the, the hands-on experience with their children. Um, and also the resources that we love for you since we just um, made the revision there in translation right now. Um, but points well taken about maximizing the communication. Um, we'll work with uh, Diana and the tiny team um, to, to be able to expand that. Don't forget the Lamar Outdoor Advertising Board. Yes. Um, the, uh, I'm glad you went to UCLA, and that's, you know, that's 60 miles to the west. You know, 30 miles to the east, and I, I thought we were working with him, but I haven't heard it. Garner Holt, uh, his education, innovation, education through innovation, uh, he's the largest producer of animatronics in the world. Are you? I, I don't know. I don't okay, know well, I, I, I would love to. I know, I know someone that knows someone that knows him type thing, and you, uh, Garner Holt Industries, he was the, really the beginning of animatronics, uh, everything just about you see at Disneyland or Knoxbury Farm, and to that, when I think about careers, as my colleague uh, talked about, you know, we're in the epicenter of, uh, of the entertainment world with Disney and Knoxbury Farm and a lot of other things, and it is, it is the gateway to AI uh, and all of that. So I'd be very interested in, in seeing us be involved with Garner Holt. He is, he is educationally minded. I mean, he's, he's developing in a 100,000 square foot warehouse, all of this, but he also has education programs. And I think as Dr. Farouk uh, so clearly identified, and as your, uh, your gentleman talked about, uh, we have a reputation that I believe will help us get through the door. So. Uh, be love to have you all get involved in that. I think you talk about inspiring young people to go on a field trip. 
and to see that and for them to imagine, you know what, I could help build these and, and all of that. So uh, great, um, very impressive. Uh, you talked about, and lastly, uh, partnerships, uh, ecosystem between community schools and the city. Uh, just a little bit on that. What are we doing with the city exactly? I know you you talked about it, Dr. Social, a little bit, but can you help me understand that? Yeah, a lot of some of those are events with Inspire Her Mind, the Social Innovation Challenge, are with the city, with um, Born Center. There's there's quite a few events that the team has laid out, and they're just continuing those partnerships. Well, I would hope and we'd we also I, I, at the Riverside Arts Academy's uh, celebration the other night, which is very nice. Um, I ran into. Uh, Councilwoman uh, Cervantes, and she was sharing that, I think it's 26 May, it might be 25, that the Chavez Center received to, uh, to be redeveloped. I would love to see us reach out to them and Vegas and others that we could co-labor with them on some space that would be the maker space like this. And uh, not that, you know, our schools aren't as accessible in the summertime, but if you look at those two centers, and I know Hunt Park's a lot like this too, but they are really the center of a uh, center. They're really the heartbeat of, of those communities and could be very much involved. And I just want to suggest that. Go ahead, sir. Um, sorry to interrupt. We've no, begun sir. conversations with Riverside Art Academy, in particular with Ms. Lee, in uh, bringing us on board to help give feedback to their development of okay. the Cesar Chavez Center. And lastly, as Dr. Farouk pointed out, as you did, the funding is meager for a district our size, and I really appreciate how y'all seem to be filling that budget as much as you can. Do we have the resources within the district, whether in staff or to reach out to professionals that do this, to seek grants uh, from the private industry? Who, I mean, I, I think Mrs. Allaby talked about this about six months ago when she met with Amazon. And I realize we're starting something with them, but again, with the image you've already burnished for this district and what we're doing with the LA Unified and all, I, it would seem we would be, our applications would be very acceptable. So do we have those resources or do we need to dedicate funds to hire outside grant seekers? Well, we have a grant writer um, in our USD and she's always looking for grants that could supplement. Um, but the key piece of looking at small cycles of how can we continue to do that? That's something we're, we're kind of diving in this year too. Yeah, well, we, it's, it's money well invested if we get one back. Thank you very much, both of you, and, and particularly to your team. Mr. Kinnear. Thanks. Could we go back to the presentation to, uh, to slide six? That would be helpful for me. You know, uh, al although the supplemental expanded and extended and specialty experiences are exciting and enriching uh, to me and to, to others. It's the, it's the core program that, that I'm most interested. If I understand what the core program means, it means what every student in RUSD at every grade level gets in, in, in terms of STEM. I'm not sure I understand what the core program is in STEM at our elementary schools. Uh, do, we have, uh, do we have a core program in STEM for all of our kids and all of our grade levels in, in science? Uh, or is, it, is that something we're developing? We have a core program in science and we have a core program in mathematics, which at the elementary level is our STEM core program. Okay, so in, in terms of what does every fourth grader uh, get in Riverside Unified School District uh, each day or each week uh, uh, in terms of science education? Students, we use a we have a base program. We, uh, we actually are going to go into a base adoption program for elementary coming up in the next couple of years to look at NGSS related resources, but that's just an informational piece I wanted to share. We have a- Let me stop you right there. We, so we have a base program. Every fourth grader in Riverside Unified School District in <coughs> science 
learns learns the standards learns these standards correct the yeah. NGSS standards for fourth grade I don't have them committed to memory okay. so I can't I, I'd like to learn more about recite them because I don't know it so that that's uh, that's something I would like you to teach me because I, I I don't know when I look at that again I'm interested in the core program because I'm I'm interested in what every every kid gets uh, at the high school at the high school level uh, you know every kid gets biology every kid gets uh, uh, gets chemistry or a physical science of of some sort uh, so you know I I, I, I know that uh, but I guess what I'm really interested in uh, is not only how we're doing but then how we're improving in terms of what we're doing and that's not I guess a part of a plan I mean uh, you know, plans are good. You know, we use words like promoting and increasing and securing and developing, but you know, they, they, don't, they don't teach me what I want to learn as a board member. What I want to learn as a board member is how are our kids doing in terms of STEM education in the core program at all of our, at all of our schools. I want to take it, uh, particularly high schools is what, is what this slide made me think about. It, it made me it made me think about, about uh, uh, common assessments. Do, to what degree do our teachers use common assessments uh, so that we make sure everybody's, we know what everybody's learning and how well they're learning it as we go through, uh, through, throughout the year. Uh, how do we uh, monitor student achievement with those common assessments? Uh, what's on the spot intervention mean in biology classes in, at the high school level? Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure what that means. I'd like to know to what degree do our biology teachers uh, talk to each other about specific lessons? Because I know from my experience, the only way to get better uh, in science and in all of our uh, academic areas is is if teachers collaborate and talk to each other about student learning uh, frequently. How how much do uh, do, uh, do we do that in science? Uh, do our biology teachers give certain labs? You heard me ask this this uh, this before. I, I'd like to know. I mean, we, we all know that hands-on learning uh, is uh, is uh, is important uh, in, in science. It motivates kids, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, you know, how how much do our our biology students uh, spend in uh, in labs? Do we have common labs every does, does every student you know, dissect a frog in high school like I did, or, is, or does that not happen anymore? Do we dissect worms or pigs or whatever? Uh, what, what are the common, what's the core? Uh, and, and maybe I'm getting, uh, you know, I get accused sometimes of, uh, of getting in the weeds, uh, and maybe I am here, but I really want to know what our kids are are learning in those in those science classes and and what the common assessments common labs common experiences are in stem uh, across uh, across our area that, that that's that's what i want that interests me um, so i hope we can uh, we can soon look at the assessment results in uh, in in science um, uh, that that will that would be something that, uh, that, that I look forward to. Uh, you know, so we referred to computer science efforts. Do we have a, a core, a, a core uh, expectation for all of our kids in computer sciences? You know, wh what, what does that mean? So uh, in the future, and we don't do this in one meeting, we do this over a period of a long, a long time. Uh, what, what what does the core STEM program uh, look like, uh, and then how are we doing with uh, with some of the practices that I described, labs, common access, assessments, collaboration, et cetera, et cetera? How are we doing with that to promote future learning? So, sorry for talking too much. Can I respond to that? No, no, go ahead. So I, I think, <clears throat> Trustee, can you, I think part of the uh, areas where that information can be helpful is 
to me, if, and please correct me if I'm wrong, to me this is about next generation science standards and textbook adoptions. I, to me, and not at a, I, your questions go beyond that. I'm not saying that, but I think a, a lot of the core of what you're referring to, I think, has been under that, uh, those topics when the board is studying those, is that that's when that information has been fleshed out. If, is that the next generation science standards and the textbook adoption process in terms of the core uh, aspects to what you're saying, for whatever it's worth? Uh, that's that's it. But I also understand, Mr. Kinnear, what your what your request is, and and thank you for that. And we can continue to have discussions to help better communicate that. I don't know why this came to mind, but have you guys seen that movie Billy Madison, where he has to go back to school? So maybe we could send Mr. Kinnear back to, school <laughs> and he could he could sit there, or you can come to my house too. I have a, a third, fifth, and sixth grader, and we have to do math sheets and science reports and um, so I, I can tell you at least in K through six our, our kids are getting a heavy dose of math and science instruction on the daily um, and I think that's the, the, the basic expectation um, so I mean I, I do get more excited about some of the specialty and supplemental programs because I think that's what creates the the stickiness and the engagement uh, the, the, I know the worksheets in math and the worksheets in science and drawing the different types of clouds and identifying the water systems are all essential parts of building upon your science knowledge. Um, but kids don't get super excited about doing those things. Uh, so how do we make school fun, enriching, and create the next Neil deGrasse uh, Tyson, right? How do, we, how, do we create, how do we create him, right? Uh, and it's with these extra programs, these field trips, these experiences at code nights and STEM nights. That's what gets kids engaged in school and gets them excited about waking up in the morning and going to school. Um, so what I really appreciate about this re report um, is that we've been able to curate exactly what we're doing across the district uh, and all the different opportunities for kids to get engaged regardless of their level of interest in science, their knowledge in science, or their age. And having it all in one place so that we know what we have. Um, and I think, uh, you know, everyone has said it already, it's a hard part about going last, um, is that we have, we have so many great opportunities for our students to engage in STEM. Uh, that don't mean you have to go to the STEM Academy, right? Uh, and having, um, and, and my, my question was gonna be, I feel like this is a STEM report and, and not necessarily a STEM plan, even though I know there, there's a, a, a larger document to it. Um, but the question was already answered, I think, was using the, the tools, the opportunities, the experiences, the partnerships that we have now, and piloting those, and finding out which one works so that you can use that information and those results then to create a plan. Because I know this plan was just kind of put together in the last, uh, in, in this format in the last year or so. Um, but I'm excited to see what we do with it from here. How do, we, how do we make this in line with what the arts plan looks like, right? So that you have different levels like, man, if we have, if we want to invest this much, this is what we're going to get. If we want to invest this much, this is what we're going to get. If we go out and get this grant, man, look what we can do. Um, so that's where I look forward. Um, forward to going uh, as, as we kind of pilot all of these great opportunities for students to engage in, uh, in STEM activities. Um, and then, uh, you know, I agree with my colleagues about, I, I think it is a little bit misleading um, about the investment we have in STEM uh, through different funding sources, even the LCAP. Because um, I think about the whole team, some of them sitting here, I mean, a majority of, the, of their time in the day has to do with STEM and it's not, it's not identified on that slide. Uh, but as we continue to, to modify and improve and make changes to our LCAP, how do we align these priorities that are outlined in this report um, with funding sources? So I, I, I look forward to those kind of conversations too. Um, but I feel like this is the, like, I know it's not a secret because when we put these opportunities out for, for coding night or STEM night, they, they fill up uh, super quickly, uh, which is a great, a great problem to have. Uh, but it seems like still, that it's the best kept secret in the district, all of these opportunities. So I don't know what we, 
we can do, and I think this is a great start. I mean, I think this is a, this is a great piece of information, and I hope it's, um, you know, put on, on QR codes and blasted all over uh, uh, to our family so that they can dive into these uh, digital versions of these reports. Um, but I, I look at maybe, it's probably a terrible idea um, and require too much work, but I think about the, the success and how we've built on that STEP conference with our partners, right? Um, and that's an opportunity for our students to engage in, in those types of activities. But looking at the success of our, our, um, our STEM nights and our code nights and how much engagement that brings from the community, not only making that available at each site as, at, at, when resources are available, but how do you recreate that STEP conference but make it for, for families? so that families see all these different opportunities that they can involve their student uh, in STEM. Um, so engaging just like we do with a lot of different programs, you know, at the Cesar Chavez Center or, um, you know, at Central or at Grant or whatever we do, these, these, these nights that we involve of our community. How do we do that on a, a, science, on a science level so that we can showcase all of these great opportunities uh, that we provide students uh, regardless of their interest in in STEM and what part of STEM. So uh, really, really well done. Um, oh, sorry, one last point I made was we talked about uh, some of our new schools that are coming out. And with the success of, well, I think knowing that a lot of the jobs of the future are gonna have some need for some STEM skills. Um, and knowing that there's a lot of interest in uh, STEM focused schools by this, the lottery that we have for our STEM Academy looking at future schools that we uh, are, are opening in coming years, do we have a STEM focus uh, for those neighborhood schools? Or do we look at some of the schools that we have now uh, and convert them to a STEM focus as well so that we can provide more opportunities for kids to, to dive deeper deeper into STEM? So uh, really well, really well done, really well presented, really well curated. I think it's a real bright spot for our district that we need to put a giant spotlight on uh, to highlight um, because as you know, Dr. Kong shared, I mean, this is, those partnerships other districts are seeking, right? Um, the fact that we're one of two that are partnering with UCLA, like everybody should know that. Um, and if somebody like UCLA is willing, willing to partner us, I think organizations like Caltech and others would be willing to as well. Um, just because we have that institutional knowledge, we have that experience, we have the, the staff capacity um, to do those adoptions, right? So um, really well done, uh, proud of the team, appreciate the presentation, and I just look forward to where we take it, take it from here. All right, so that concludes uh, the reports for this evening, and that's our last item on the agenda. Uh, so at the end of every meeting, I always want to reach out to my colleagues and ask if there's any board members with future uh, agenda items that we can schedule. All right. I'd like to see, uh, if I may, sir, I'd like to see the uh, Dr. Rainey uh, dedication of the conference room one. I believe we have the outline. It, I think the... Is it? Okay. Yeah, the request was just to put an application in to follow the process, and then we can put it on the board agenda. And the board will receive both of those reports, uh, the one for the, op, uh, the facilities and for that committee, the memorial naming. What do you mean? The, the reports, like the one that Mrs. Allaby read from, the one that Dr. Proof. Once, once they're uh, approved, so it would probably be a while, but. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. All right. So that will uh, conclude our meeting for this evening. Our next meeting is on Thursday, November 17th, uh, 4 o'clock. Uh, we'll open to uh, closed session, and then open session will start at 530. Good night, everybody.